আমি আগে থেকেই বলে রাখছি মানে ওলি দিকে সিনিয়র হিসেবে যে ভোট অফ থ্যাঙ্কসটা দেওয়ার জন্য ভোট অফ থ্যাঙ্কসটা আচ্ছা 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 তুমি বলে দিলে ইন কেস ইন কেস গোপাল দা ইজ অ্যাবসেন্ট ও নাও গোপাল দাই দেবে না হলে আমাকে একটু নক করে দিও আমি ইয়া ইয়া ওয়ান ওয়ান আর্জেন্ট অ্যানাউন্সমেন্ট দ্যাট প্রফেসর অসীম দত্ত রায় ইজ উইদিন আস নাও এন্ড স্যার হ্যাজ জয়েন্ট থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ সো মাচ স্যার वेलकम सर वेलकम वेलकम आवर department is uh, to, all together is present here and uh, our hod dr arpita sharnokar dr ali khan shain dr devoshree gupta dr uh, professor rakha dash gupta and also professor pushpita sharkar our teachers council secretary is present and uh, one of our resource persons dr alok bera has already joined so thank you so much and uh, very much welcome to you sir we will start our uh, session uh, very early Is it possible to check my slide now? Yes, sir. It's possible. It's possible. Okay. So how to do that? I uh, tried. Sir, a... Yeah, um, uh, in your screen, sir, you just see the present now button at the right hand okay. bottom corner. 
Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, sir. It is being presenting, and yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, sir. The screen is already there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Sir. So now I can turn it off. Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, now uh, all of us have already joined in the Google platform. So we are here to start our program and the schedule is also going on. Hello, a very good afternoon to all of you, respected faculties and research scholars. We are really happy to get all of you over this digital platform to witness this international conference in the form of webinar on gene expression. One of the most relevant keyword that we all should deal with to know the mystery within the biological system. We always expect you in offline mode, but the situation has compelled us to meet you over this digital arena. Though this online platform would carry greater significance in future when even the pandemic time would be over and we will witness a healthier earth. This is the age of progress and prosperity. You all know friends of biological sciences and gene expression is there a buzzing word. At my undergraduate level, one of my professors delivered a lecture on gene and he promptly suggested to write one thing on the very first page of our class copy in capital alphabet. That is gene equals to God. We all know about a proverb that man proposes, but God disposes. Exactly. Likewise, gene is something that disposes all the activities, performance, expression of feelings, everything that we deal with each and every time. How far my professor's talk was relevant. Today, again, we will witness through the esteemed deliberations of our very honorable resource persons, namely Professor Dr. Oshim Kumar Dottoroy from University of Oslo, Norway, Professor Shonji Bhokto from University of London, UK, Dr. Shobhik Mukherjee from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, India, and Dr. Olok Bera from Purdue University, Indianapolis, USA. With the utmost inspiration of our teacher in charge, Professor Shiva Prashad Dash and our Bangabashi College family members, including all teaching faculties, non-teaching staffs, and all other supporting staffs, we are able today to arrange such an international web conference where conglomeration of participants from every corner of our country and also from abroad has been occurred, and we are really delighted so. The internal quality assurance cell, that is IQSE Bongobashi College, has held the baton with Department of Botany Bongobashi College to convene this seminar. And we are really indebted to Dr. Gopal Chandra Mondal, IQSE coordinator, each and every stakeholders for making this event a real one. We are really happy to get also our distinguished patrons of Bongobashi College, Professor Pushpita Sharkar, Teachers Council Secretary, Professor Devashish Chakraborty, member governing body, Barsar, Dr. and Barsar, Dr. Arjo Mitro, member governing body, and Dr. Partho Ghosh, member governing body. Now it's time for welcome address. So as a convener, I would uh, just forward this baton to our honorable in charge of this event today, and one of our most senior teachers in our college, Professor Dr. Torun Kumar Sharma. So, sir, just now it's time to address, sir. So, please, sir. So, 
Torun sir. Sir, do you hear me, sir? Torun no. sir. Torun sir. Do you hear me, sir? <coughs> just hold on friends uh, it's i think a technical problem is uh, happening on his side just a minute please. please pardon for this technical glitch Hello, Torun sir. You are now there. Please unmute yourself, sir. Please turn on your audio, sir. Okay. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's time for welcome address. We are waiting for that, sir. So please start, sir. Uh, okay. Start. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mm, good evening, respected faculties. I'm just scholars of different colleges, institutions, and universities for the whole country, and also from abroad who have joined this web conference. We are really delighted for your overwhelming response for this one day international conference or webinar what do you say on the expression the momentous keyword during the surgery organized by Department of Botany in collaboration with ICAC Bombay Gong Bungabashi College 
welcome all of you to this conference over this digital platform. Uh, during this pandemic situation over the globe, we are deeply concerned with the academic pandemonium to better rise the academic upliftment and future prospect of biological science, we are really very thoughtful. That's why we are here. Again, on behalf of Bangabashi College, welcome all the participants to witness the enthusiastic and knowledgeable lectures of our resource person. I also bid welcome and congratulate to our beloved and esteemed Department of Botany and its members of organize the seminar and also welcome. No one has joined. I'm going to link click on the link. I'm going to talk to you. Okay. I also bid welcome and congratulate to our beloved and esteemed Department of Botany and its members of the organized such seminar and also to welcome ICAC for this initiative. I specially congratulate Dr. Orgho Sarkar for his initiative and also to our teacher in charge Dr. S. P. Das for his continuous support. A special and warm welcome to our esteemed resource person Professor Dr. Ashim Dr. Roy from Australian University, Norway. Professor Sanjeev Bhakta from London University, UK. Dr. Shobhik Mukherjee from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, India. And Dr. Alagda from Purdue University, India Police, USA, in this webinar and also convey our deep regards for accepting our invitation as this is persons for sake of our uh, teaching fraternities and aspiring scholars. Hope and believe this, this evening will make our path of future morning when we will follow for it definitely. Thanks to all. Good evening. Hello, Tarunda. Mm. The YouTube link is not working. Nobody can see any. Hello. Hello. The YouTube link is not working. Yeah, Doctor, uh, Doctor Beda, YouTube link will work and it is working and already some persons have joined, but in, uh, there is something technical glitch is also being happening. We are trying to resolve oh, it you. shortly. Oh, Google will cut over. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So it's now time uh, for ah. head of the department, Dr. Orpita Sharnukar. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, to say uh, just a few words uh, about the department, and then it will be introduction to the all organizing committee by uh, okay. Mrs. Rakha Das Gupta. So, okay, okay, okay. please uh, say a few words. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Didi. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Urpita Shornukar, head of department of botany, Bangabashi College. I welcome you all to the one day international conference or webinar on gene expression, the momentous keyword during this century. Today's webinar is the second in series 
of our departmental webinar. The first one was the one day state level interactive student webinar on insights into biotechnology for BSc and MSc students held on 11 July. The webinar was very successful with around 450 students, participants who interacted freely with Shukugash. our resource persons, Dr. Hello, Robert Banerjee of Dr. B.C. Guha Center for Genetic Engineering and Dr. Shayo Ganguly of St. Xavier's College, Department of Biotechnology. Now I'm here to discuss some of the departmental activities of uh, our department, uh, of our students and faculty. At present, our department has seven teaching members and three non-teaching staff. The Department of Botany started long back in the year 1939. Botany degree course commenced from 1995. The department possesses a very long history of academic performance and excellence. Our department has got all modern equipments and facilities for teaching. The laboratories are well equipped with modern microscopes, autoclave, centrifuge, spectrophotometer, laminar airflow, etc. We have a large museum which is unique for its collections of various botanical specimens. The departmental library is a small repository of near about 600 books in addition to the central library. Our department proudly possesses a good stock of herbarium called Acharjo Girish Chandra Bose Herbarium, which has collections even from Ishwar Chandra Vidyashagur to Acharjo Girish Chandra Bose, who is founder of our college and a botanist by himself. Our department regularly organizes long botanical excursions to different phytogeographical regions in India for teaching students about floral diversity in different natural habitats. Visit to AJC Bose Indian Botanic Garden is an annual fair for all students. Apart from academic studies, the, our students actively and enthusiastically participate in publication of wall magazine called Magnolia. Seminars and quizzes are regularly organized by our students around the year. In 2016, two days hands-on workshop was held on bioinformatics sponsored by WBDST and our college for our students and faculty members. Looking at the popularity and quest for the subject in present day scenario, we moved on with a two month certificate course on bioinformatics and cheminformatics next year. Many students from our college and other colleges participated and took benefit of the course. In our department, seminars were organized for students by some eminent speakers like Professor A.K. Bishash, Department of Botany, University of Calcutta, and also international speaker like Professor Oshim Dotto Roy, Professor of Faculty of Medicine, University of Oslo, Norway. We are fortunate to have him today as speaker once again. Recently, our students participated in a two-day workshop on flowering and non-flowering plant identification organized jointly by Botanical Survey of India and Department of Botany, Gurudash College. At present, our students are keeping themselves academically active and participating in a number of webinars organized by different colleges. In fact, Today's webinar is also organized by our students. Recently, they made and circulated a short video in social media on Environment Day with teachers elaborating the role of plants in maintaining biodiversity. I am proud to announce that our current semester students have fared very well in their university examinations. In this period of gloom, I request all of you to be safe in your homes, maintain proper hygiene and social distancing. I hope today's webinar will be successful and the participants will be enriched by the deliberations from our esteemed resource persons. I'm thankful to all the four of our resource persons for accepting our invitation and taking out precious time from their busy schedule and enlightening us with their presentations. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Sharnokar. Thank you so much, Divi, for such enlightening uh, speech about the departmental activities of our department of Botany Bangabashi College. So one uh, announcement uh, from my side as a convener, uh, extremely sorry all of the participants for the technical glitch and you that uh, just uh, witnessed that the YouTube link was not happening. Some of the persons has already joined firstly, but uh, so for unknown reasons, it was suddenly stopped. So now I have already uh, posted a link in the WhatsApp group, a new link. You just please follow that link. The total program will be live. And uh, I, as the technical glitch was there at the very beginning, so I just uh, yeah. beg, beg very much pardon to all of you. And uh, now, again, I am welcoming all of you on behalf of Department of Botany and IQAC Bangabashi College to this webinar. And now it's time to uh, introduce to the organizing committee and by Shrimati Rakha Dashgupta of Department of Botany. So Rakha, Madam, please. Good evening, everybody. Thanks to all for joining with us in this international webinar. It's our introduction session. I am Rakha Dashgupta, lab instructor, Department of Botany, Bangobashi College. Now I introduce the members of our organizing committee to all the honorable participants. For that, I would request our departmental faculties to unmute their video. First of all, I introduce our senior faculty, Dr. Torun Kumar Sharma, Associate Professor in Botany. Yeah. <laughs> Our senior madam is there, Dr. Uli Khan, madam, associate professor in botany. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Rakha, for introducing me. I know everybody is waiting eagerly to hear to the resource person who will be speaking on gene expressions in different aspects from different parts of the globe. Please, yeah, you will be enriched with this webinar and also enlightened. Enjoy the webinar and interact with the resource person through chat box. Thank you all. Stay safe and healthy during this pandemic season. Thank you, Rakha. Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Next, Dr. Rosita Shailukai, madam. You will be enriched with this Stay webinar. Up. And also in Lytek. What happened? Next, Dr. Rosita Sarnukar, Madam, Assistant Professor in, Depart in Botany. She is also our departmental head. Please, Dr. Sarnukar. I again welcome you all, all the participants. Please enjoy today's all the deliberations because we have very esteemed resource persons i hope you will all enjoy it and enjoy it and thank you all thank you rakadi thank you Urpita, madam dr devushri gupta madam associate professor in botany madam please good evening everybody and a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you rakadi for introducing me thank you Dr. Biplav Bhakti said, Assistant Professor in Botany. Good evening to everybody. Thank you, Rakadi, for introducing me. Welcome uh, to all in this seminar. Thank you, Rakadi. Thank you, Biplav. The youngest faculty in our department, Dr. Orgo Shorkar, Assistant Professor in, Depart in Botany. He is also Convener. the winner of this international webinar. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rakadi, for introducing me also. And uh, for the, uh, participants, I again and again repeatedly uh, beg pardon to all of you for the technical glitch that has been happened in YouTube. 
now i think you the program will be very much smooth and our resource persons are very much waiting and we are also a big pardon to professor roy and dr bera who has already joined sorry for this technical glitch so we will continue now thank you thank you so much rakadi now we are all waiting for the eminent speaker so i would request our departmental madam dr oli khan associate professor and former teachers council secretary to introduce the renowned resource person professor dr ashim kumar dostoroy thank you rakha das gupta uh, am i audible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. so i'm starting good evening everybody i feel a great honor to introduce and represent the contributions of professor dr ashim dottoroy in this august meeting in one day international webinar in bongowashi college dr dottoroy will talk on maternal factors induce epigenetic changes in the utero that contribute to the health of offspring in later life which is a burning topic Professor Dottorai did his MSc in biochemistry and PhD from Calcutta University and also did MD and DSc in USA he started his journey from India to USA in 1983 as National Institute Health Fellow now he is the professor of nutrition and medicine in the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences University of Oslo Norway he is also group leader of research and head of chronic disease section his scientific work has been published in 260 original contributions reviews books book chapters and editorials he has successfully supervised 30 phd students and md students he has many international patents and contributions in medical science the discovery of fruit flow is one of them which is a anti thrombotic technology for tomato at the rawel research institute aberdeen university scotland uk which has been approved by european food safety authority in the year 2005 and marketed by provexis company in uk and was launched in europe in november 2010 in a conference in madrid for best innovation in madrid sorry for best innovation in the heart and health category it was it was launched at present dr dottorai's main focus is research is focus in research is to find novel dietary means to reduce the risk of chronic disorder such as type 2 diabetes cardiovascular diseases cancers and to study the interactions between the dietary factors and genes affecting these diseases he has been awarded many prestigious awards and honors in 1987 elizabeth kushner memorial award for prostaglandin research by american heart association in 1996 hofmann la rose award for pito placental research by the international conference on pufa nutrition and disease prevention in barcelona spain since 1992 he has been working as an honorary professor of robert gordon university aberdeen uk since 2000 he is working as an honorary professor in international college of clinical nutrition he is a member of nobel and peace committee for selecting prize winner for physiology and medicine norway oslo he has many books some of them are books on cellular protein and their fatty acids in health and diseases nutraceuticals and human blood platelet function he is the chief editor of international journal on food and nutrition research he has delivered special lectures in four mega cities of india that is kolkata delhi mumbai and gurgaon organized by sanofi india 
he also delivered lecture in the plenary session of Indian Science Congress and Mysore also in the year 2016. He had also delivered a very informative talk in our department of botany in our college in the year 2017. The topic was uh, medicine, gene, and nutrition and health. It was a very informative lecture. Thank you all for giving me a patient hearing. Now I would request Professor and Dr. Dottorai to deliver his presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali Khan. Thank you, uh, Orgul Sarkar uh, and whole Bangabasi College and Botany Department for inviting me to give a lecture uh, at your webinar. I'm really humbled and pleased and honored to be part of this deliberation. And uh, I, uh, it's rightly said, I was there I think, uh, two years back. And uh, I was, I enjoyed uh, my stay there a few hours and I'd like to join again. <coughs> Thank you all. Uh, I will start without much ado, my lecture now. And uh, I, I have to find out how to do it now. Yeah. 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 So, can you see? Just a minute. I have to open my lecture. Just yes, a I, I would request to, to my, all of our teachers uh, to just unmute your, just mute your audio, please. Just mute your audio, please. So that our Don't resource person, yeah, Don't audio it. and video is, yeah. Can you see my see yeah. my link? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'll be uh, Torun sir, uh, sir, uh, just uh, mute your audio, sir. I <laughs> Torun sir, just mute your audio, please. Sir. Torun sir, just mute your just... audio, please. Torun okay. sir, just mute your audio. You are uh, still now. Okay, sir, uh, so Professor Roy, please do continue. Okay. Uh, my topic today is uh, maternal <laughs> factor. Mute for the Mute for the Mute for Sir, please my mute yourself. My next topic today is uh, maternal factors that induce fetal epigenetic changes in utero that can contribute to the health of in the later life. I will extend a little bit that talk to not only the, the nutritional and other environment that a developing fetus facing while well, utero, I will go a little bit further at postnatal stages or the breast milk and other ambience, uh, how it is affecting um, baby's health, overall health from, uh, uh, from uh, skeletal muscle, bone, to psychological development or brain development that I will be trying to touch. It's a very complicated subject and also it covers so many things. Rather, uh, that's why I think that I should just go some of the slides and give you the flavors that what uh, uh, is there actually. So if you look at uh, uh, these slides, there is a slide that I got uh, from Emmanuel papers that is showing that uh, uh, an observation, an observation that in, 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 in Dutch famine in the Second World War, that uh, those babies, those were born during the World War II when there was a paucity of food and nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. All these babies were born and then later life, uh, they developed cardiovascular and other non-communicable diseases. And, and it continues for two generations. And similarly, uh, those uh, parents uh, or mother especially, those who have a, enough food and diet, they don't have that sort of babies. So this is a clear human evidence of inheritance, what is happening during the development, utero, utero and um, ut development in the utero that have a long lasting effect in overall health, uh, human health. That is one of the example that I just to tell you. And then uh, Barker uh, lately he hypothesized that it's called developmental origin of human adult disease, the duha. That means whatever environment we face as a fetus in the mother, 
and that lead to some changes uh, programming that, that that can be have can have a um, uh, effect uh, later on in the life especially in terms of developmental in in, in presence of, in the in and some epigenetical that I'll come later on imprinting imprinting is very important issue because uh, imprinting genes uh, are, are important when the fetus grow because some of the genes are imprinted either from the mother's side or the father's side uh, uh, genome because uh, they can compete each other or they can produce double uh, 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 protein. So there is the imprintation is very important because, uh, for example, uh, the mother doesn't want placenta to go big way. Uh, they want uh, it should grow as it is so it can keep the nutrition and food for the later pregnancy uh, uh, thing. But father wants, father genes wants placenta to grow as much as possible so that his, uh, you know, uh, 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 progeny can grow uh, maximum potential. So there is always a fight between mother and father genes in terms of to have a maximum reproductive potential. And I'll come a little bit later the how it is controlled and what is the abnormal, uh, the problems we are facing uh, right now. So there are a lot of things can happen uh, in the utero, and it could be nutritional, it could be environmental pollution, it could be also microbes that I'm, I'll put a little bit later on that issue. And if you look at this slide, this is a very interesting slide published in Nature a uh, uh, long time back, uh, I think 10, 15 years back. It is a uh, it is an agar to gene expression. If you look at the uh, right side, the uh, uh, the the rat uh, mice, sorry, that uh, if you give BPA, the bisphenol uh, A, that is a very important component, so a very widely used component in plastics, uh, they actually lower the methylation of the agar to genes. And if the rats are given BPA. Then if you look at the left side of the rat, it is a very obese and golden color fur because the agatogen is a lower, there is a methylation, lack of methylation there. But if you have the, if you give the BPA and the methyl rich food, folic acid, et cetera, et cetera, then it is normalized. So you can see the competition even uh, between the nutrition and the environmental exposure is, is going on. And that can actually changes the phenotype of the, of the, of the, of the fetus. And for human, it, it, for the first thousand days, very important in terms of uh, ex, uh, uh, fetal development and later issues, because uh, uh, the most important uh, thing in human situation is in human brain development that happens during the last trimester of pregnancy, which I'll come later on, and the influence of epigenome, and also a little bit in postnatally the mother's milk, how important it is. So first thousand days are very important for the will, for the better and optimum development of the fetus and babies postnatally. And maternal nutrition, over or under nutrition, vitamin D status, dietary methyl donors, long chain fatty acid intakes and food pollution, that all can contribute. And also maternal microbiota and the mode of delivery that is very important. Normal delivery or secret delivery that actually control a lot of uh, uh, the important contribution to micro microbiome that the baby is having it, and also the well-being of the babies, including the psychological development, and of course the antibiotic exposure during the first uh, of two years of the first uh, of the uh, earlier lives and also the difference between urban and rural development, human milk, and also uh, the human genome and environmental factors, how this interaction between the maternal nutrition, microbiome of the mother, how it is transferring to the, uh, uh, the fetus, uh, because fetus is the placenta is no more sterile, the microbe can go from the mother to the fetus, and they have a lot of positive roles unless mother is infected, and also delivery time is also important, how the baby is delivered while we are, we are, we are getting out to the mother. And in normal delivery system, we get 4.5 ml of microbiome. That is the first gift and the best gift mother gives to their children. And that is uh, that microbe is colonized in our gut and whole life we keep it. And they produce uh, a lot of vitamins and can affect brain uh, uh, function, mood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that I'll come later on. And microbiome also can change the epigenome of the baby, of the, of the infant, 
and and there is a huge crosstalk going on between maternal nutrition, maternal microbiome, and how it is affecting the epigenome. So first thousand days are very important. And before I go to my lecture, epigenetics, and uh, probably all of you know how what is epigenetics. Epigenetics means on the gene that there is a uh, sequence of uh, DNA and uh, that is there, we cannot change unless there is a mutation, but there is above the genes that is called epi on the genes, epigenetics, that is a modification. Our body is can try to change the expression of the genes by changing the, modi uh, by epigenetic method, by, by modification of certain things, not the sequencing, but the like uh, DNA methylation, histone modifications, and non-coding uh, mRNA are the main mechanism by which the epigenetic modification can happen. It, its main job is to, to, to increase or decrease the gene expression. And it's very important for imprinting of the genes. It's very important for uh, uh, methylation and demethylation. And it is very important for whole uh, for our health development etc cetera, etc cetera. and if it is wrongly done then we have a big problem and if you look at this slide it's very important actually but it's a very crowded slide even before development the parental epigenic profile are rewritten when the both egg and sperm they come together and within an hour or so there is a global demethyl demethylation happens and this is happening because the, uh, in, um, uh, in the in the embryo, this uh, they, they they want to clean the whole uh, whole uh, genome. No methylation, nothing from mother's side and father's side. And paternal genes are highly highly rated or fastly demethylated in the maternal side. And once the demethylation uh, done, then it is remethylation again goes on. And the way the, they put all the methylation in in order because all the t cell and tissue has a full genome. So they don't want to double expression on, from mother's side or father's side. They imprint the genes in order to make sure it either is from mother's side genes are expressed or from father's side. So this sort of uh, epigenetic uh, writing or rewriting or, or erasing is very important while we are in embryo. And in embryo, uh, uh, see, uh, this happens very fast and then remethylation happens and I, I must tell you that the, how important is the nutrition and the folic acid and vitamin B, B, they are involved in that sort of methylation procedures. And then the methylation goes on actually while the fetal uh, develops and last uh, 10 months and also later on also. That I will come later on a little bit. But when it comes to the human development, the most important organ is placenta. Placenta develops at 14 weeks and it is the main interface between the mother and the fetus because they, they are the, this organ is the most important organ in supplying oxygen, nutrients, even pollutions, everything, and with a timely fashion. So the placenta actually, its size, its transport activity is very important. And if the placenta has some problem, is insult to the placenta, whether in terms of dietary deficiency, glucose, amino acid, or fatty acid, or other problems, then placenta changes in order to maximize the growth of the fetus. In doing that, then fetal also try to reprogram uh, 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 because of the placental capacity of transporting nutrients is compromised. And uh, in that way, we call, in India it is happening a lot, we call uh, thin fat babies because uh, the baby they need when they're born adipose tissue, need a lot for thermogenesis, et cetera but it happens at the cost of the muscle. So most of the babies born under this condition has a kind of insulin resistance. The study done in Pune, along with um, uh, Barker in uh, Southampton University, they showed very well for the similar size of the body, baby, the babies uh, compared with the British uh, <coughs> cohort, they found the Indian babies their body weight is, uh, uh, is small. They're trying to do it to increase the uh, uh, increase the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, by increasing the insulin resistance. Uh, they have insulin resistance. They try more of this because they are born with a less muscle. And if the, if you don't have a proper amount of the muscle, then you will develop insulin resistance. And most of the babies born those who are under this condition, they are already diabetic when they are born. 
So you can see the importance of placenta uh, in fetal programming. And fetal do the, does this because they, they know that they need adipose when they're born. And then uh, they, because they cannot uh, really compromise uh, uh, brain growth, cannot compromise adipose growth, but they compromise the muscle growth. So doing that, they develop the insulin resistance. And these babies will develop will, will, when they're born, they will have a two uh, different growth. One is a catch-up growth, one is a stunted growth. Catch-up growth, they try to get more weight and they will, they will acquire quick uh, body weight and they will be obese. And other group will be stunted and a big problem. So anyhow, these are the, this is the way they develop this uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, programming, which lead to the more of, uh, as you see today, of uh, <clears throat> non-communicable diseases like uh, obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the nutrients and environmental chemicals that the placenta passes from the mother to the fetus, all I mentioned here, uh, that folic acid, vitamin B and DH and EPA, these are the most important in terms of epigenetics. As you see, this epigenetic can Change, uh, can regulate is adenosyl methionine, and these are very important for methyl donor to DNA. And, uh, and these uh, nutrient factor, nutrients can re directly regulate this methyl uh, um, <coughs> transfer. And uh, of course, uh, there is the environmental stimuli if the mother is drunk or oxygen tension, and also BPA that I'll be talking a little bit later of the, uh, because it's the most important component in the plastic world. And we have everywhere, even, even in our body, BPA is there and how it is impacting the epigenetics as well as the total growth of the fetus. Now, effect of maternal fetal supply of nutrients and microbes and their effects are epigenet, epigenome. A mother transfers so many things uh, through the placenta. And I'll be talking to the two main things, long chain PUFA, microbiome, and environmental pollutants in terms of uh, BPA, that is the most important pollutant in the Western world, as well as in India, because of use of huge uh, plastic. The, they, they actually changes the epigenetic reprogramming processes, leading to different phenotype changes and different degrees and varied uh, disease risk in the offspring. But first I will talk about the microbiome. If you see, during normal delivery, the infant receives a significant inner column of colonizing microbes from the mother canal and intestine. Conjugal neonates born by C-section, they don't have it. The study shown in recently in Cambridge University, these babies actually doesn't get a very important microbiome when they're born by via C-section. And that could be, could be a major problem in terms of uh, ADHD and uh, high uh, blood pressure and other situation. And this microbe, is difficult to get it in later life because uh, the, it is colonized by different sorts of bacteria. And uh, this uh, study from Denmark showing that 1.9 million subjects, the incidence of immune mediated diseases, including asthma, juvenile arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease, are significantly higher in CS C section born children. So, and there are a lot of studies coming now, and it is showing the importance of the normal delivery. In country like Norway, we don't do at all the C-section unless it is medically required. Now, uh, the idea before five, six years back that, that we are in a mother's womb in a very sterile environment because placenta is such as giving the barrier, but it is not true anymore. It, it is shown very clearly that the different uh, bacteria, very good bacteria the mother provides through different mechanism uh, to the fetus and they're already started colonizing there. And if you look at this uh, slides, and they're showing that, uh, that how this uh, different microbial population is colonizing the uh, uh, fetus and how they are giving, uh, how the mother is transferring the passive immunity to the, to the, to the fetus by transferring this uh, bacteria. And these bacteria are there when they are grown, but unfortunately, these babies, if they are coming by C-section, then they don't get very important from the canal of the mother. Uh, the four to five ml of bacteria, these, these we get. This is the first gift of the mother that you get 
through our mouth and then goes to the intestine and colonized. And this is the most important that is really missed by the babies born by C-section. Now, why and how these gut bacteria are, are, are actually changing the epigenome and other situation? You see that when uh, we take a, 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 a complicated carbohydrate, polysaccharide-like dietary fiber, et cetera, et cetera, they are not really absorbed in the small intestine. They go to the large intestine. And in adult uh, large intestine, we have more than two kilos of bacteria. And mostly, they are colonized as we are born from the uh, 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 normally we get from the mother and other they come there. But if we are not treating, uh, if we are not don't get the antibiotic, then bacteria is happy and the good bacteria are there and they produce this sort of activity. One is uh, product is carbohydrates, uh, uh, short chain fatty acid. Butyric acid is a very important. We now know this butyric acid produced by this bacteria in the gut from our. B, B, beta glucan or other polysaccharides, and this butyric acid goes to the brain, blood brain barrier, and they're very important for, uh, uh, for keep upkeeping the brain function, upkeeping the uh, brain uh, uh, to protect the neurons for, from death, if, uh, for, for, like it happens in dementia and Parkinson disease, in dopaminergic uh, uh, the neurons, etc. They protect very well. And also they produce so many other things, long chain aldehyde, secondary bile acids, hydro, they have a, all good effects. But these bacteria are certain species that we get from the mother and lactobacillus and other things. But if we don't have these bacteria, and if we kill them bacteria by antibiotic, then the, then the uh, normal bacteria from the environment, it could be pathogenic, it could be no effect. They are actually colonizing our intestine and is of no value. And, and if, I, if you look at this slide, these microbiota produce the bioactive uh, metabolites and they produce the epigenetic changes in the fetus. The most important metabolites produced by the bacteria are folic acid, butyric acid, biotin, acetate, and acetyl-CoA. They actually regulate the epigenetic processes by methylation or acetylation of uh, uh, chromosome, et cetera, et cetera. And butyrate is one of the most important methods to maintain the colon homeostasis which is produced by bacteria, bifidobacterium. That is, we get from the mother when it, if we come through the canal and also other bacteria. And butyric acid has a histone deacetylase. It's very important for histone modification and important in epigenetic uh, writing. And also butyrate can uh, influence the metabolism of epigenetically regulating obesity-related genes. And these, those babies, uh, as I mentioned, from C-section, they have a tendency to gain weight, obesity, because they don't have this sort of mechanism or lack of it. And uh, as I mentioned, butyrate also affect DNA methylation process by regular donor availability. And butyrate only comes uh, from, not from the, exactly from the diet. It is coming from the uh, polysaccharides, which is not metabolized uh, in the small intestine, then it goes to the large intestine where the bacteria ferment it and produce the bitter. We produce butyric acid and that it goes to the blood and then goes to the brain and everywhere. So if I uh, uh, summarize here that uh, this uh, uh, bacteria uh, uh, colonization in the, in the baby and the fetus, they are regulated uh, by, uh, as I mentioned, how they are born and the breast spreading status, and uh, birth mode I already mentioned, and antibiotic uh, during the pregnancy or after the pregnancy. These all can change the gut microbiota and immunity, and that can have an important impact on the, on the fetal uh, overall competence against immunity, obesity, and et cetera. Here you look at the right side, there is one example, as I mentioned, that, uh, that can happen. Uh, TA17 cells, is increased if the proper uh, bacteriums are not there, and that can increase the uh, uh, in, interleukin one, uh, 17 receptor expression, and, and that can lead to brain disorder. It's called cortical malinformation. And really, this thing, uh, the autoimmune predisposition predis uh, can be regulated if we have a proper, if the mother has a proper kind of microbiome and gives to the placenta. Now I come to the brain development, and in brain development, you know that in in human uh, during the last trimester, this is the most important stage. 
actually where DHA and arachnoid acid are transferred, transferred from the mother to the fetus because they need a lot of it during the last trimester is a program uh, uh, development and their, their DHA is a structural material of the brain. A um, lot of, actually 80% phospholipids are made of from DHA and arachnoid acid are important for cell signaling. And it is the mother, honest to the mother, they have to supply these two fatty acid most importantly during the last trimester for, for the fetal uh, brain development. Unfortunately, those babies born during the last trimester, premature babies, they have a lack of it. Actually, I started this work in 1990s uh, to understand the what sort of nutrition the premature babies should have it uh, in terms of brain development, retinal function. Uh, we started how and what more the placenta supplies this fatty acid during the last trimester. That is the main reason we started this work. And we now know that uh, premature babies, um, you can a little bit replenish by giving the, uh, the DHA and arachnoid acid, but most of the uh, baby food at that time, they don't have DHA and arachnoid, only linoleic acid, which is not that good. It produced a lot of oxidative stress and, and create a big problem for the brain uh, tissue. And uh, now most of the baby food have uh, DHA and arachnoid acid, but it's very important they get easily oxidized. So there should be some kind of mechanism how it should be protected in, in the baby food. Anyhow, this uh, DHA and arachnoid acid have, have, have a huge importance. And they, if the baby is uh, missing that, they not only have a compromised brain development, there will be epigenetic changes that will come later on that will also have a permanent impact on the, on the, on the brain uh, situation. Uh, in the uh, baby. If you look at this slide, the DHA is the most important fatty acid, docosahexanoic acid, omega-3 fatty acid, that is present mostly in, um, uh, in, uh, in the seafood, uh, mostly in the cold water fish, not much in the sweet water fish, uh, only Hilsha has some, and its precursor, alpha lilonenic acid, is present only in Urodal, and we are lucky as a Bengali, mustard oil has uh, quite a considerable amount of alpha lilonenic acid, and they can co be converted to DHA by the mother. We have shown that mother anywhere in the globe, uh, whether vegan or vegetarian or non-vegan, whatever it, they mobilize huge amount of DHA during the last trimester of pregnancy to replenish, to give, to supply for the baby's fetal development. If you look here in the last third trimester, it is exponentially DHA is, uh, uh, is uh, transferred from the mother to the fetus, and it goes on if during the breastfeed time also, if, if babies get mother's milk. And there is uh, and that is the one of the reasons mother get a pass postpartum depression because the DHA level drops like anything because fetus are and the, uh, in the uh, babies in the postnatal case getting a lot of DHA from the mother's milk. So mother needs to replenish DHA a lot. And it, it is shown that omega-3 fatty acid supplementation might help in order to come, uh, cope with this depression. And if you look at this is not a really easy issue for the mother to transfer DHA from its own source, adipose tissue, then to the blood, and then to the fetus. Because if you look at here, the concentration of two important fatty acids, arachnoid acid and DHA is much low in the mother's compartment compared to the fetus. We call it biomagnification. And now we know it is generally done by, this is all our work, different fatty acid binding protein that is present in the placenta surface. They actually pick up this fatty acid that is in circulation in the mother's blood and then give, give it to the fetus. And this is done by FABPM. And we have done a lot of work and showed that how important it is in the brain development of the fetus because these are must be expressed in the placenta in order to make sure that the fetus get whatever DHA arachnoid is available in the circulation from the mother to the fetus. And this is our... Uh, uh, a cartoon uh, that we showed that the importance of all these fatty acid binding proteins uh, is very important. And this protein FABPM is responsible for uptake of DHA and arachnoid acid. And that is very important uh, for, for the fetal growth. Now the question is a uh, situation like India where the DHA uh, level is pretty low uh, what happens to them and what sort of epigenetic mechanism is going on 
so that uh, the fetus can grow, uh, try to grow at least properly in terms of brain development and what is the role of the placenta in those cases. And if you look at uh, DHA, DHA, uh, as I mentioned, it is very important for the fetal brain uh, as a constituent as well as secondary messenger. We now know a lot of it. We have uh, a lot of work in this area. The DHA uh, gave rise so many factors. We call the neuroprotectin, docosanoid. These are very important brain signalings. So is arachnoic acid. And if you look at the left side, the arachnoic acid and DHA are esterified 98%. So it is a very, very important tissue where the DHA and arachnoic acid are highly, highly selectively stored there. And it is initially started from the mother, then from the plasma, free fatty acid is the major source as, as a modus operandi, DHA and arachnoic acid transfer to the brain. And there are a lot of uh, clinical trial going on if, when, it comes, when it comes to uh, Alzheimer's disease, when it comes to uh, uh, dementia, when it comes to Parkinson disease and other brain disorders, even bipolar disease, how the DHA can help them if, if we replenish. The problem is, is the human brain, uh, they develop blood-brain barrier it is very difficult. So th there are, uh, if you look at, uh, if you search in PubMed, you will find hundreds of thousands of papers, a lot of human trial going on in order to see whether the adult can increase the DHA level in their brain. But why you have to replenish? Because if you look at the neurotransmitter and all these things, the DHA is hundreds of molecules. They are expressed and they are used up by the brain. So there is a, always a tendency of DHA is used up in sort of the, the process we do. Even in nighttime, our brain is more active than the daytime. And these are the, all the signaling molecule that is coming from DHA and arachnoic acid. And they are involved in terms of memory keeping or, or dememorizing things and, and other kind of, if you look at the right side, the, all these secretagogues, et cetera, DHA and arachnoic acid is highly involved. And the question is, how can we get the enough of DHA? And if we don't get what sort of the epigenome, epigenetic mechanism in place, and uh, that I'll come later on before I go to the uh, another section. This is very important because the pre preeclampsia it, it is a rising in India and also in you know, most of the countries. And preeclampsia is that at the week twenty two, the mother develop a high blood pressure and uh, the uh, and proteinuria etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And only way to uh, rescue mother is to take the fetus out, and uh, and there is no other way. And future fetus will be premature. And if they survive, it will be it will have a compromised life, and mother will have a big problem. But one of the one of the mechanism uh, why there is a preeclampsia, it is because if you look at these uh, two slides, normal placentation and abnormal placentation. When the embryo is formed, and then embryo, there's a, the, when the placental uh, is formed, the trophoblast we call invading trophoblast. If you look at the blue cells here, they are invading maternal wall. Met, uh, and you see, they changes the um, <clears throat> blood vascular bed. It is generally wrinkled. They make, make they expand it. So there is a low blood pressure zone is created. So the blood can come to the fetus enough and can bath the nutrition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if this invasion is not uh, complete, if you look at the right side, and then there is a wrinkle things and and the blood is not coming uh, coming enough and the fetus is not growing because placenta size is important. It's directly proportional to the fetal side and the brain development. And in abnormal placentation or the lack of placentation or invasion, that, that means it has already remaining the uterine spiral artery as it was before pregnancy. And it is not expanded and it is not replaced by trophoblast. As you see here, they become pseudo epithelial cells uh, and it is it is it is cut off from the from the neurons and other innervation so it is a, it's a, it is it's like a, a big mouth of the sea so the blood can come and, and and bath the fetus and it does not happen if there is a placental placentation is not hand enough happening and that can create a big poor placentation gives a oxidative situation in the placenta and that lead to a lot of changes and, uh, and epigenetic changes and that fetus becomes small and ultimately may not survive and mother life is in danger also. And we have shown that the docosahexanoic acid that is very important 
during the last trimester of pregnancy also is very important at the first trimester or before conception and the, because it 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 helps the top invading tropoblasts or first trimester tropoblasts to invade the uterine wall as you see here the branching of uh, dhs give the maximum branching uh, of this tropoblast in the uterine wall compared to any other fatty acid so this is the first time we showed that DHA, docosaxonoic acid being a nutrient is very important. Uh, the, the fetal, the placental tropoblast to invade the maternal uh, uterine wall and making it a bigger placenta and because more blood will be coming and placental size is big and that will give rise to better uh, and, uh, and appropriate uh, growth of the fetus. And, and then we found that Indian situation there is a uh, coexistence of the low birth weight and intrauterine growth relation with DH intake and status of the Indian subcord. This study published in Indian Journal of Medical Research in 2009 from, and this work done in mostly Pune uh, tribal area and, uh, and some in, from other South India, and they're showing uh, really uh, the intake of DH is very low. In uh, average in India, intake is 10 times lower than uh, in, uh, in uh, Nordic countries. So it is, it is pretty low. Only in Bengal may be a little bit better off because um, we have a, a mustard oil and urod dal and spinach. They give the linolenic acid, not DHA. And linolenic acid can be converted DHA if you have a right kind of body, uh, endocrine function, insulin, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, it will not be converting uh, to DHA. So the onus is really to the seafood. And uh, and also egg, uh, the free range egg, not 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 the not the commercial uh, or or grown uh, chicken egg, not like that. So these uh, uh, DHA they they have the DHA little bit and can replenish little bit, but still the DHA level is pretty low. And uh, and if you look at here, this is done in Pune that showed that the placental size and weight is directly proportional to DHA per 100 grams of fat. If you look at here, the, uh, they, they found is uh, more DHA, much better uh, placenta weight, and of course, the fetal outcome. So this is, uh, this is uh, clearly showing that we have a problem in India in, when it comes to DHA, uh, placental size, and human development. And it, it, is, it is shown that uh, the maternal in, in early pregnancy is, is a cohort, lot of cohort study done. And it is showing that the DHA is so important for fetal growth, as well as in, in, in terms of preventing the lower birth weight and, see, and also epigenetic. Recently, uh, we have done some work uh, with collaboration in, in, uh, in National Institute of Nutrition in Hyderabad. And there is showing the RAT study. If you have an omega-3 deficit condition, you develop so many, the, the pups born develop so many problems. They, they have a fetal, Adiposity, uh, body fat distribution problem, altered energy utilization, body fat accumulation. As you see, uh, thin fat babies, the fats are in the tummy, not in the leg or hands. Uh, that should be there. Muscular and bone development problems, uh, chronic stress in the brain in terms of uh, 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 what you call it, markers, altered neural and reward pathways, and attention deficit and hyperactive disorder is there. But this could be also contributed by if the babies are born uh, uh, not um, normally and epigenetic stability and disease risk is there. So this is the problem that, uh, that uh, the important uh, dietary in nutrients that mother need, the uh, whole world knows now, and a lot of studies done, the DHA and arachnic acid, and unfortunately, it is, it, it, we are in a very low situation in India. If you look at here, the, the several studies done now, with long chain uh, fatty acid, uh, mostly DHA, and, uh, and then look at differentially methylated regions. And if you look at here, the, and the Greek study, a newborn study in Mexico, and uh, children of DHA supplemented pregnant women study done in, in Canada also, and they found there is a big problem. The genes are really changes, and there is a uh, DNA methylation changes in uh, even up to six weeks of supplementation, and uh, is a is a big problem. And it is shown that uh, in a DHA deficit condition, this sort of gene expression could be a problem and could lead to different phenotypes and may not give us the optimum functional and healthy 
babies because of uh, lack of DHA, because they are not only uh, involved in brain development and retinal development, but also the lack of it or insufficient of DHA that lead to the methylation uh, uh, problems of the genes and that lead to different phenotypes of the babies. And we are now understanding what sort of effects are there. And if you look at here, the microRNA mediated epigenetic processes also can be changed by omega-3 supplementation. And it is shown that adipogenesis and vascular inflammation is actually, if you supplement to it in uh, omega-3 fatty acid, DH or EPA, then you can uh, increase the microRNA uh, 143 that is controlling adipo adipogenesis and obesity is good. And decreasing this uh, other microRNA, these are involved in epigenetic mechanism, including uh, targets for uh, talk drive receptor signaling, they modulate the vascular inflammation. So you see this omega-3 fatty acid is just not a structural material for the brain. They are also involved in uh, epigenetic processes, the human also. And there are a lot of studies done now. I will not go details into that. If you're interested, you can check in the PubMed that uh, omega-3 fatty acid, if they're in a deficit condition, that can lead to several epigenetic uh, changes and that could lead to different outcome. Now, important is uh, uh, vitamin D also. And if you look at here that uh, low vitamin D status during the pregnancy and vitamin D deficit condition is, uh, is uh, very prominent in India and Middle Eastern country though despite a huge amount of sunshine because raw materials is not there, etc. And that lead to changes the uh, uterine programming because of the vitamin D deficiency. They have a problem in uh, tissue composition, gene expression, immune, you know that immunity is directly regulated by vitamin D and changes the bone mass and brain development and placental development and fetal programming also can be affected by vitamin D insufficiency. And that can, that is uh, this low vitamin D status during life can lead to preterm um, uh, maternal fetal HIV transfer situation, respiratory problems, wheezing asthma, type one diabetes, food allergy, autism, food, and also can lead to hypertension, obesity, so on, and osteoporosis and all these things. And if you look at uh, the BPA, I'll come to the later on the BPA concentration, that's a plastic. Unfortunately, I didn't have a space much, so I put it there. The BPA, the human situation, the bisphenol A is one of the ingredients of the plastic. It is all over our body. It is in the breast milk, maternal serum. It is in the placenta, cord serum, maternal uh, urine, and nearly is everywhere. Now, what is the impact of BPA? BPA, it is a, one of the ingredients of the plastic. Its structure is given here. It is uh, plastic. Those plastics are in, uh, used in telecommunication in clothing, footwear, packaging material, food packaging that facilitated transport, wide range of food, drink, and other goods. And this, uh, the BP is very important for plastic for clear, clear and tough thing to make it, and is made into a variety of common consumer good. And BPA is detected all human tissues all over the world. And we showed that uh, in a rat study, if you give the BPA diet and control diet, you look at here, the right side, there is a changes of the methylation. It removes the methylation. So it creates a hypomethylation situation in the rat mm -hmm. situation. Recently, we started working on the placental epigenome impact of BPA. If you look at here, that the, that, uh, the embedding tropoblast that we mentioned is very important for the first trimester, during the first trimester of pregnancy. This tropoblast must embed maternal uh, uterine wall an endometrium partly in order to make the placenta bigger. And if the BPA, BP or BPS, it is now used in another chemical form, if they are yeah, yeah, increased, then these cells are, are, are killed by this, uh, by this bisphenol. And, uh, and, and these are the very low concentration, 0.1 nanomolar, 1 nanomolar, and 10 nanomolar. And 10, 10, at 10 nanomolar, you kill all the cells. So these plastic ingredients, if it is present in the maternal blood, etc., they might have a huge detrimental effect in terms of pregnancy, initiation, and other processes. And this is a uh, in vitro study we published recently. We showed that uh, this is a you know kind of a 
branching of, of these uh, cells. They make a different tube formation in a, in a, in a kind of a uh, uh, wall. And if, you, if the BPA, BPS is there, there is a big problem. This wall is uh, disturbed. And we showed that uh, that uh, uh, the expression of these genes, like BGFA, and these are very important in 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 in, in pleasant uh, topoblast growth and invasions. These are all actually downregulated uh, by uh, by this, uh, except the uh, hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. These are a kind of a uh, enzyme responsible for degrading the BPA. They are only increased. Others, all the important enzymes. Uh, the mRNA is decreased by the presence of BPA. And lately we showed that methylation index also decreased uh, in, the, in, in placenta by the presence of BPA. So BPA exposed cells actually, even there is a proper nutrition, uh, nutrients are there. If the BPA is present in the mother's uh, system, that will lead to lower methylation of the, of the, of the topoblast and that would lead to abnormal gene expressions, and then can lead to a problems in the pregnancy. So if we summarize in terms of biome and fetal epigenetics, the placental amniotic fluid that contain a lot of bacteria is, 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 is the good bacteria that give, the, the mother gives to the fetus. And, uh, uh, and also the mode of delivery is very important. If it is a normal delivery, we get a very good amount of bacteria from the mother, from the canal. And I think it is the first gift of the mother to the, to the baby. And uh, luckily all we have when our time, but it is not true anymore because we have, we have seen more sick babies in Indian subcontinent. Uh, than in Europe, it is almost uh, non-existing uh, <clears throat> here unless there is a medical condition. Antibiotic exposure during the first two years of life it is almost banned in uh, European countries because they destroy this bacteria that mothers gift to the babies. Uh, this, and that then if, if they're destroyed, they are occupied by the other sort of bacteria that is of no use or may be harmful. And the breast milk and formula feeding, uh, they have a formula feeding does not have a uh, probiotic, or, but now these days they're trying to add there. And the breast milk of course has a bacterium that is very important for the, for, for, for the fetus, uh, for the babies to grow. And of course, uh, during pregnancy, uh, the maternal factors is very important, nutritional status, omega-3 content, BMI, weight gain during pregnancy is an important issue, and microbiota composition. All these actually impacting the fetal uh, growth and development, brain growth, and later on uh, in, the, in the postnatally, that is programmed in our uh, system and that will determine what sort of disease, especially uh, this uh, uh, mental disorder, obesity, cardiovascular disease, how it is inset uh, during this uh, first 100 days of life. And the most important thing is that, of course, I mentioned there is a, uh, in nature, a lot of food components, they have a power to change the gene expression. So although we get the genes, we don't change the genes, but we can regulate the expression of the gene by different behavior and lifestyles. Food is one of them, as it is very important in, uh, in, uh, in early development uh, during utero and later on, but still in the life, in our adult life, we still can change by taking proper uh, kind of food that will give us proper uh, methylation procedures uh, and maintaining the methylation state, and that is very important. And also, it can also counteract some of the things I mentioned, that BPA, the environmental pollutant, they give hypomethylation. Uh, as, as you see in the left side, the rats, uh, mice, sorry, is taking um, uh, BPA without methyl donor from the fruits and things. They mice become obese uh, because of the agglutigene is hypomethylated, is not controlled anymore. But with the right side, with the proper amount of methyl donor, one can interact, uh, that these mice can interact, the bad impact of uh, uh, bisphenol A. So I will finish uh, the talk like this way, that uh, uh, the most important and vital period in our life while you, you are in utero and, uh, and, and postnatally during your mother's milk, and the honors with the mother, 
because uh, to give to maintain the proper ambience in terms of nutrients, in terms of microbiome, and also the mode of delivery, how we are coming out from the mother. And that, and later on, the breast milk uh, that contain a lot of nutrients, are very important, and plus microbiome, that will make the healthy baby and, uh, and a proper programming so that interact the immune deficiency, they can interact the prob uh, problem with the uh, mental uh, cog cognition development. They will have a proper uh, <clears throat> proper mental development, and also they have their idea, the hyperactivity would be less, more attentive. And we are now understanding much more in terms of epigenetic regulation of our whole system, including the brain, how they even include the behavior, smoking, etc. How they have a detrimental effect. So with this, I will. Um, finish my talk. Again, thank you everyone for listening to me. If you have any problem or any problem in understanding or more clarification, uh, my email is there. You can send me or I can talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Roshan Dr. Roy, for your so much enlightening presentation, sir. Thank you so much as because we have very time constraint and uh, the different resource persons are belong to different time zones. So I just uh, request uh, Professor Roy to answer the, just to a few questions, uh, very small amount of questions that have uh, asked uh, by our participants. So first of all, uh, Dr. Shorodip Chatterjee is asking, what causes anencephaly and its fate? Okay, I think uh, that's a thing uh, I should talk uh, different times, not here because it okay. is uh, more uh, different problems and then it's complicated. But if you send me email, I will send the answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then uh, Dr. Moshumi Sarkar is asking, uh, is epigenetic change contribute in shaping the maternal microbiome during pregnancy? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, there is a kind of a, a crosstalk uh, between microbiome and, and uh, other situations, including the food and nutrition, of course. If you look at uh, the adult situation, uh, resveratrol that present in grapes and in, uh, in red wine, that actually helping the good bacteria to grow than killing the wrong bacteria. And that is the, one of the benefit that we think is coming from red wine because of changing the microflora. Yes. Thank you, sir. Then uh, one question is: Is uh, by Rupa Mitra, Dr. Rupa Mitra, is there any relation to autoimmune diseases in babies with maternal microbiome and maternal placentan characteristics? Okay, I, I think uh, because you don't have less, uh, you have time less. But I will just mention that I showed you uh, TH17 is very important uh, autoimmune disorder, and it can be regulated a little bit by microbiome. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and uh, by Bornali Boshu Roy, it is about the development of PCOs in future life and reprogramming of it. Sorry, I couldn't gather. Yeah, sir, uh, she is asking, what's about, sir, your opinion about the development of PCOs in future life and programming of it in intrauterine life? Okay, PCOS, you're talking about polycystic ovary syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah, sir, I think so. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, this is very common now in, in our subcontinent because of the pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but uh, there is no study yet uh, whether in the fetal uh, situation how it is uh, it is uh, ending up that sort of reason. We don't have any data, but of course uh, it is shown that uh, uh, even the exposure of the some of the uh, uh, environmental pollutant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in adult life or growing adolescent life that can lead to PCOS, including dietary fat, et cetera. Things are like a lack of exercise, uh, things are there. But in terms of fetal programming, uh, we don't have the data at the moment to say anything. Okay, sir, one last question from Dr. Ronup Kumar Sharkar, that uh, how can the COVID-19 effects on DHA accumulation? <laughs> there is a study yet on the DHA accumulation. Question is where? But in terms of uh, uh, accretion to the brain, you have to have a DHA, but accretion is not good enough because of the blood-brain barrier. But still, you can take omega-3 supplement uh, maximally 1,000 milligrams per day 
and that could lead to uh, um, could uh, enhance or increase the accretion of the brain but human brain is highly uh, because of blood brain barrier in place so it's difficult but uh, of course uh, uh, because of uh, other problems immune problem etc there could be a, 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 what should i say the use of dha in the brain because of uh, different circuit can be uh, activated and can be, but we, we don't have any data in terms of dha supplementation of course uh, people are worried and interested to know more uh, about the mental uh, situation during the covid time thank you so much sir and uh, uh, there is overwhelming response uh, that is for your good presentation by our all the respected participants in youtube who you can see and uh, for participants uh, all the other questions that you were asking to professor roy uh, i assured that all the questions will be forwarded to professor oshim dr ryan by email so that he can uh, meet up all these questions uh, later so thank you so much professor roy Thank you so much. And uh, now we will go to the second session. And uh, Professor Shonji Bhakto from University of London. Welcome, sir, Professor Dr. Shonji Bhakto. Sir is uh, waiting uh, for a while. And uh, now it's time to introduce him just for a while. And now I hand over uh, to the dear responsibility to our esteemed colleague, Dr. Debo Sri Gupta, Associate Professor in Botany, Department of Botany, Bangalore College. So, Madam Gupta, please. Good evening. It's my privilege to introduce Professor Sanjeev Bhakta to you all. Professor Sanjeev Bhakta is a full professor of molecular microbiology and biochemistry, strategic dean, internationalization and partnership, and program director of global infectious diseases at the Institute of Structural and Molecular Biology, Birkbeck, University of London, and UCL. His continued research interest in infectious bacterial diseases is focused on developing novel therapeutics as well as repurposing existing drugs to tackle antibiotic resistance and persistence in tuberculosis. To date, he has published more than 100 original research articles for a number of internationally acclaimed journals Following a BSc honors uh, and MSc and PhD in molecular microbiology and biochemistry from world-class universities and research institutes in India, Dr. Bhakta joined the Oxford University Division of Medical Sciences as an ISIS Innovation Senior Research Scholar. He graduated from the Queen's College, University of Oxford, completing a second doctoral degree that is DPhil in pharmacology. He became a full professor in 2019, and he has supervised a large number of PhD students, postdoctoral scientists, a UNESCO Laureate Women in Science Fellow, an ERS Fellow, and many more. Professor Bhakta is a core member of UCL TB, an MRC funded TB Drug Discovery Consortium, UK, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine in 2008 and elected as a fellow of Royal Society of Biology in 2017. He is an antibiotic action champion member of the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Today, Professor Bhakta will be speaking on modulation of gene expressions in an infectious lung pathogen and pleiotropic mechanism of action of a repurposed immune modulatory drug. Dr. Bhakta, please go forward with your deliberation. Okay, thank you so much for uh, such a kind uh, introduction. Um, first of all, can you all hear me? Like if I could uh, at least know that um, I'm audible, then I can start. Yes, sir. You are clearly audible, sir. You are clearly audible. Okay, excellent. Uh, generally, in a lecture theater, I uh, ask that if everyone is hearing from the back now that this is a very challenging time, and we are all doing this online uh, delivery of the lectures. So um, uh, the challenge to me is basically to keep up with this presentation and for you to really um, uh, engage with me over next 
um, 40, 45 minutes um, because we don't see each other. We don't see each other's facial expression. So I do not know that how you get on with um, my presentation. Uh, but before I do, I kind of really like to thank Dr. Arpita Charnukar and uh, Dr. Orgo Sharkar uh, for inviting me and also the organizing committee. This webinar is uh, very special to me. Why it is very special? Because um, I kind of spend um, a good time this morning with the dark lady of DNA, you know, Rosalind Franklin, um, not with her directly, but with her work. And I was commemorating um, her 100th birthday today. Uh, and I was kind of um, seeing the privilege of us um, really following up her legacy of um, uh, uh, groundbreaking discovery, which helped us to really continue um, um, my own research and many others who actually um, um, work on molecular biology or their research is very much DNA um, uh, dependent on understanding DNA uh, as a molecule. So uh, I will um, uh, really move on to um, our research, but um, I know that we have only a very limited time to talk about uh, research. Uh, the research I started um, independently in 2006. So um, before that, I did my PhD in Bose Institute and uh, I was working with the head of medical science division for a few years. Uh, but since I started my own lab, um, it's already almost uh, 15 years uh, down the line, and we uh, always focused on global infectious diseases, particularly on tuberculosis, and tuberculosis is prevalent in uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries, including India. I wish I could speak in Bengali because my origin uh, is uh, from Calcutta, so I really would like to kind of present my work and interact with you in Bengali. But unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, scientific research we do day to day, um, impossible for me to explain and translate them in uh, into my own mother language. So, um, uh, so we will carry on uh, and we will spend as much good time as possible to explain the research we did and uh, are doing uh, to date, uh, but I will be highlighting mainly on uh, one aspect of our research, uh, and I would uh, hope that we will have more interactive session later on to talk about the other part of our research. So, as I said, that uh, my research is um, mainly to focus on tackling antibiotic resistance in global infectious uh, diseases uh, and pandemic at the moment. Um, we are all concerned about uh, a pandemic which kind of changed our life, day-to-day -day life. Um, um, and uh, obviously, uh, that is a viral disease, uh, and my research is on uh, a bacterial, infectious bacterial disease. Um, so I will highlight uh, an area where if we are not really uh, keep focusing on and keep investigating, then obviously there will be other waves of pandemics coming up. Uh, and that is exactly what I meant. Uh, antibiotic resistance in superbugs. And I'm sure that uh, we all heard about uh, WHO, World Health Organization's priority bacterial pathogens. And if we are not really tackling antibiotic resistance in those superbugs, extra smart bacterial pathogens, then we are expecting um, more than uh, 10 million people, uh, uh, people's life uh, in next couple of years. So therefore, it is very important that we keep our focus on um, uh, the area of uh, antibiotic resistance and understand collaboratively that how we could tackle antibiotic resistance in, uh, in, in bacteria. Now, obviously, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which caused TB, is uh, the biggest uh, challenge uh, among all the other bacterial pathogens. And there are obvious reasons for that. Um, I'm sure that we can spend hours on discussing how mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, really exists at a different physiological states and how they become um, uh, such a smart bacterial pathogen to overcome, to evade uh, from the host immune system. Uh, however, I will limit my discussion there uh, and I will highlight that why uh, we are so concerned about uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, which caused TB. Uh, because um, this is an ancient disease and, uh, and uh, it's a treatable disease. We have vaccine for uh, this particular uh, bacterial uh, pathogen uh, to tackle this disease. However, still uh, around 10 million new cases are reported uh, getting reported all over the world. And uh, we also seen even last year that there were about 1.5 million people uh, died from this particular disease. More 
importantly, you need to uh, understand that um, uh, almost one third of the global uh, population are carrying mycobacterium tuberculosis in a dormant physiological state, and they can uh, develop into an active disease and cause the disease anytime for many different reasons, um, which I think uh, are very important for fundamental investigations. Uh, now, Alongside uh, that, we also uh, experience an alarming rise in antibiotic resistance in TB bacilli, uh, and uh, about 40,000 uh, extensively drug-resistant TB cases are reporting um, uh, all over the world every year, uh, and extensively drug-resistant uh, cases are uh, nearly untreatable because there is no uh, antibiotic uh, which can affect effectively uh, tackle extensively drug resistant TB cases. So I'm I'm very sure that you will able you will be able to find out WHO definition about uh, drug resistant TB, multi drug resistant TB, and extensively drug resistant TB. So you will understand that what treatment we use currently and what are the treatment options available for multi drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB cases, um, and how challenging that is. Um, uh, you will see that one of my very close friends, colleagues from uh, uh, Brighton and Sussex, um, represented by this cartoon representation, uh, where you can see that uh, a multi-drug resistant uh, TB sufferer is basically saying that I don't care, Brad, I just can't keep up with taking those pills anymore, uh, because there are loads of side effects um, of um, taking a cocktail of antibiotics, and not just uh, for a week, um, for at least six months when we are treating tuberculosis. So there is no doubt that we need um, um, fast, rapid diagnostic techniques. Uh, there is no doubt that we need uh, more reliable uh, vaccination strategies. But more importantly, we need to have a very effective uh, chemotherapeutics to uh, tackle uh, mycobacterium TB um, so that we can uh, really uh, pose a challenge to this uh, global threat. Now, uh, there are several plans and, uh, sir, and sir, also- ex uh, Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Hello. Uh, me, uh, me, yeah, I'm your uh, Sir, uh, I am interrupting you. That's. Uh, are you presenting your slides, sir? Yes, I am. Uh, but uh, no, sir, uh, still in notes and not till now. Please, uh, you should click okay. on present now button, sir. Okay. So can you not see my screen? Uh, no, no, sir. Only, only no, you okay. are visible, sir. Yeah. Okay. So that's a challenge now. Um, how do I do? Sir, have you got the button present now? Um, that uh, yesterday in uh, demo meet, we have also experienced that the present now button will be acting here. Yeah, I think it says that you can't share your screen. Uh, sorry. Okay. So let me let me see what I could do. Yes, sir. Now it is being presenting. Okay, good. That's good news. Um, so now you can see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Can you? Yes. Now the, okay, yeah. good. Now the... Right. I'm really sorry that I, I, I think I gone few slides ahead. So um, I would like to really ask that whether I should start again or. But, but um, sir, one thing, one thing, uh, one thing that is uh, what should be your first slide because here it is showing that one laptop and um, here some Rosalind Franklin. Yeah, that's a funny here. thing. So yes, of yeah. course that is my first slide. 
Okay, that's that's so nice. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good, Please do continue, good sir. Good to hear. Okay, great. So I think I kind of you already know that what I did this morning, and that is the context of this slide. Uh, so I spent some time with uh, this dark lady of DNA uh, and her outstanding groundbreaking work, and uh, and that is exactly what I said. I'm sure that you all heard uh, that how this uh, discovery of DNA led us to do what we are doing these days. Okay, so. I think I will uh, cut short that introduction part. And uh, what I will do is, um, I think you heard the background uh, of how I um, created um, a, an introduction about this particular disease and disease causing pathogen and how concerned or worried we are about uh, the superbugs causing uh, global infectious diseases and how we could tackle. So I think because you heard that, I can skip through and I can tell you that uh, why antibiotic resistance development uh, is so important in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes TB. Uh, and I already presented that um, uh, a large number of new cases are getting reported. Uh, 1.5 million people are still dying, although we have got uh, antibiotic treatment options, we have got vaccinations, uh, and we can diagnose TB. Uh, and I also said that uh, almost one third of the human population are carrying mycobacterium tuberculosis in a dormant physiological state, right? So I do not need to tell uh, you again, uh, but it is more of a kind of reiteration. And no matter how many times I tell you the same thing again and again, that how important it is that we need to really work together collaboratively to uh, really tackle this alarming rise of antibiotic resistance in uh, TB causing bacilli, because uh, still uh, around 40,000 new extensive drug resistant cases are emerging where uh, there is no way we could uh, tackle this particular um, uh, situation. Uh, people will, uh, the sufferers are dying without having appropriate uh, uh, or effective uh, treatment regimen. And that is when I said about this cartoon, uh, which was uh, built by one of my colleagues. Um, and I really think that this is a serious cartoon, uh, um, a very humorous way to tell that how serious this is, that a patient is saying that I do not really care of taking any more pills. Uh, I really would like to die. Uh, and that is not very good to hear when you are really uh, investigating on a, on a disease and you do not find any uh, good effective solution to, uh, to that. So I already uh, told that to you. Uh, and there I uh, was uh, when I said that we have got number of different plans is not just about our lab, but also um, uh, labs which are uh, working together with us, the institutions internationally uh, who joined their hands uh, with us. And there are a few uh, Indian institutes. I would name Institute of uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, uh, Institute of Chemical Technology in Mumbai, uh, Birla Institute of Technology in Mesra, for example. Um, so they have uh, been, they have received their support from Newton Power Fellowship, Commonwealth scholarship, and they uh, send their scholars and postdocs to work uh, in my lab. Uh, so this is what I'm going to present, the plans and the work I'm going to present. Uh, obviously, I lead on uh, the, the aspect of tackling antibiotic resistance in TB uh, from mycobacterial research lab. However, this is a collaborative research, so I will be uh, acknowledging all my collaborators in the end. So we have got several plans. Um, and now I do not have time to really uh, explain all those different plans. Um, uh, however, I'd like to highlight plan A, which is to find out new uh, drugs, new antibiotics to tackle novel, um, uh, to tackle uh, antibiotic resistance in TB. And the expectation is that they will have novel mechanisms of action so that they will be effective against uh, both multi-drug resistance trends as well as they will not interfere with highly active antiretroviral therapy. And they will be effective uh, ideally against all the different physiological states of this TB causing bacilli. Uh, here I mentioned about active and latent TB uh, infection. Uh, now, obviously there are some progress and you see that if there are some new antibiotics developed in last 40 years, and they are these betaquilin, linezolid, delaminate, uh, and uh, pretomanid, um, and uh, they are really helping um, the new drug development in the field of TB and uh, and saving uh, thousands of uh, people's lives suffering from MDR-TB. However, we see that there is a huge need to fuel this uh, drug discovery and design uh, pipeline. And when we see that 
uh, new drug discovery or design uh, pipeline or our strategy, it comes from a fundamental research, like uh, from the weight lab bench to the bedside of a patient where you see a lot of investment, uh, a financial need uh, is there. Um, um, thousands of scientists uh, needs to be working together for a, a long period of time, several decades. However, the most important thing is uh, the uncertainty of designing, discovering a new molecule and, uh, and developing that uh, to make sure that the patients are getting uh, those new molecules next to them uh, in the, uh, at the bedside. Uh, so with that challenge, I think, I must tell you that itself, the TB causing uh, bacteria um, really um, uh, cause a, a lot of smart um, uh, strategic move when they enter to our body and, uh, and try to win over our immune system. So you can see in this complex slide, uh, obviously there are uh, some very good publications around from our group. So I would encourage that you go and read about them. But here in simple term, I can say that uh, when uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis enter to our body, they obviously cause two steps of uh, two different levels of uh, immune attack or compromisation with the immune system. The, the innate immune system um, uh, tackle the initial uh, attack of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then later on the cell mediated uh, humoral immune uh, system, which then play a complex uh, uh, battling uh, between the host and the pathogen to determine whether mycobacterium tuberculosis will still replicate and cause the active disease, or they will move into their uh, dormant physiological state and leave there indefinitely before they find that opportunity uh, for them to wake up and cause the active disease. So, in short, I think uh, what we found that mycobacterium tuberculosis can live um, in actively replicating or non-replicating stage in our body. And the current antibiotics, they can only uh, tackle mostly the actively replicating phase of the bacilli. Uh, however, uh, there are need uh, for new antibiotics where the hope is that they will target non-replicating bacilli as well. Now, because it takes uh, such a long period of time and those um, risks or uncertainty of developing a new drug to tackle the actual sufferers which are um, there already in the world, uh, we obviously came up with uh, several other strategies and the plan B or the, uh, or the second strategy which I will be focusing on today uh, to share our research uh, will be how we can repurpose or reposition some of the existing over-the-counter medicine. And that is where we have some uh, discoveries made uh, and that is what I would like to share um, without any reservation, uh, particularly because because next week you will see that our paper will be published online in Journal of Antimicrobial uh, Chemotherapy, which is an Oxford University Press journal. Uh, and I'm uh, very pleased uh, for all my co-authors that this work, which uh, carried in our lab for last seven years, now got uh, published in a very high impact factor uh, journal for you to read. So if you uh, get in touch with me, I, uh, that article in any way will be freely accessible uh, to anyone around the world. So, and, uh, so let's move on. And uh, let me uh, tell you that why repurposing is such a good idea, because not only those drugs are already existing, uh, so you don't, we don't need to design any new molecules, but also the most importantly, their pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, information and the toxicity data are already available uh, through that developmental stage. So therefore, um, the, the, we can, save time, we can save resources, and we can see, especially if there are dual activities for those drugs who can perform uh, multiple mechanisms of action and who can target multiple uh, uh, essential mechanisms in a bacteria uh, to really overcome these challenging infectious diseases. With that note, uh, not that just us, but there are other researchers around the world uh, uh, thought in the same way, um, and, and uh, through their strategy, you see that from John Hopkins uh, University um, published an article on oxyphenbutazone, where they first claimed that oxyphenbutazone has got an antitubercular uh, activity. And at the same time, uh, in my lab, we were working on a more common non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And you see that we reported um, uh, almost seven years ago for the first time that ibuprofen and, uh, and some of the other uh, common non-steroidal anti-inflammatory inflammatory drugs are showing specific um, uh, selective anti-tubercular action 
Um, they are also effective against uh, replicating, non-replicating, and multi-drug uh, resistance strains of TB. Uh, and also we found that uh, the in vivo serum peak concentration, which I can uh, discuss uh, if there is any clinical interest here, uh, that serum concentration is more than uh, the in vitro MIC, which we determined. N not only that, these uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs shows some synergism with the existing anti-TB drugs in vivo. So that is something which we found fascinating and groundbreaking, and that made us to work on why these non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are actually um, immunomodulatory drugs are showing anti-infective properties or, uh, or more precisely anti-tubercular specific uh, activities. And with that question, we moved on to uh, understand uh, that um, how these uh, molecules could be repurposed to uh, treat um, uh, tuberculosis. Now, obviously, I will uh, highlight some of the other uh, publications around, uh, around us uh, in the field continuously highlighted uh, the scope, the opportunity of uh, repurposing non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs uh, to treat uh, infections. Uh, and uh, with the current COVID 19 situation, I think immunomodulatory drugs are again um, uh, re uh, resurfaced um, uh, for their uh, endogenous mechanisms of action because uh, it is important that any lung pathogen enter into their primary site of infection, obviously through the uh, host pathogen interaction. Uh, um, a, a very uh, a phrase which is very uh, becoming very common to everyone uh, at this stage is uh, uh, called the cytokine uh, storm. And then uh, to really tackle that cytokine storm, uh, often immune suppression or immunomodulatory drugs um, uh, prove to be very useful uh, in, a, in a combination therapy. So that is a very uh, rough idea, but around those immunomodulatory drugs, knowing their anti-infective properties are becoming very important uh, to understand that whether we, uh, uh, we are able to really run a clinical trial uh, to treat uh, tuberculosis more effectively. Now I'll go back to the fundamental aspect of this uh, mechanism of action study. And I'll tell you that why we think that one of those non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, here I'm talking about carprofen, uh, which was used and still in use uh, in veterinary uh, uh, surgery uh, to cure um, uh, pain in, uh, in cattle, in dog. Um, and that particular non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug which shows a, a very strong, potent uh, anti-tubercular uh, specific activities, we found some um, uh, their intrinsic properties, uh, more anti-infective wholesale properties, which I think would be very interesting for you to know and uh, for me to discuss. So here we found that not only carprofen uh, is um, um, killing mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, by targeting essential mechanisms inside the cell, but also carprofen has got a very interesting property. Now, obviously this is not a class where I can talk about uh, how antibiotic resistance develop in bacteria. Um, I'm sure that most of you are aware already that there are many reasons how uh, antibiotic resistance develop in bacteria. And two of those key intrinsic properties, which I'd like to highlight today. Uh, one is uh, wholesale drug influx pumps, and the other one is uh, biofilm formation. Those two intrinsic properties, particularly in mycobacterium tuberculosis, we see that uh, are contributing to the evolution of uh, multi-drug resistance or extensively drug resistance in TB. And Interestingly, we found that the carprofen is uh, inhibiting uh, the whole cell drug influx pump mechanism in mycobacteria. Uh, let me explain this experiment a bit more. So we used ethidium bromide as a substrate for drug influx pump. And you can see, if you can see my cursor here, so you will see that uh, ethidium bromide, uh, when they are in aqueous solution, the fluorescence get quenched. When they are in hydrophobic environment, uh, that fluorescence get activated. And you can see this emission and, ex uh, and excitation uh, wavelength. And at that wavelength, you should be able to detect that ethidium bromide is getting into the uh, cell. Uh, and then after a few minutes, when the whole cell flux pumps are getting activated, uh, then uh, they will start uh, uh, getting effluxed or pumped out as well. Now, influx and efflux, when they uh, are EQL, then you see this plateau. So this is a, our control experiment. Now, you see these two lines. Um, Verapamil uh, is here. 
uh, and chlorpromazine is here. Those two are already known as a potent uh, anti uh, uh, drug influx pump inhibitors. Uh, so they are already known, and, and Verapamil is already in the clinical trial studies. If you follow this green line, you will see carprofen is there, which shows that carprofen is showing an extremely potent. Uh, efflux pump inhibition, uh, inhibitory activity in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And remember that we are using uh, sub MIC concentration of carprofen. Uh, we've gone even down to one tenth of the MIC to, uh, to observe that they are inhibiting uh, drug efflux pump. Uh, more interesting, I'm sure that we can talk about this, discuss uh, about them later on, if that kind of create more interest in the field. Um, however, we found that um, the like Verapamil, carprofen also showed uh, a reversible mechanism when uh, we withdrew the drug concentration from the solution. So this efflux pump uh, inhibitory mechanism is reversible uh, per se. Um, moving on, I think the question was that uh, if they're inhibiting a wholesale drug influx pump mechanism, uh, whether this uh, inhibition is energy dependent or energy independent, whether they uh, whether they are hydrolyzing ATP, uh, because there are different types of drug influx pumps present in bacteria. And I'm sure that you know about, uh, some of you know more than I do, uh, that there are different kinds of um, energy dependent uh, efflux pump present in bacteria, energy independent pumps are also present in bacteria and many of them together cause multi-drug resistance in, in bacteria. So our attempt, uh, which you will see in this article, was to really create a platform where we will be able to monitor that whether they are inhibiting in an energy independent or energy dependent fashion and whether they are actually disturbing the membrane potential, which is also an important criteria uh, to inhibit that mechanism of antibiotic resistance development. So as I said, that along with drug flux pump, as you can see that those pumps are transmembrane proteins and they're extremely important in communicating messages uh, from one uh, within the community of bacterial cells. And then when they form community of bacterial cells, often we call that phenotype as biofilm. Now, mycobacteria indeed form biofilm um, in a static um, condition or in, uh, or in a flow condition. They form biofilm, as you see here, is uh, that biofilm is uh, forming in between the air and liquid media interface. Uh, now, that is a cartoon representation. In reality, you see that uh, when we are not adding any drug and leaving that biofilm to form, you can see from the thickness and visually, you can observe that how mycobacterium tuberculosis formed the biofilm. Over a period of time, if you are actually using the solvent you use to dissolve the drug, or you are increasing the concentration of carprofen, as you are increasing, you will see that the biofilm formation is getting diminished. And uh, not only, um, uh, please keep an eye on the biofilm diminution, but also you see a, a change in the phenotype of the biofilm. And that change in the phenotype, uh, we observed uh, in a in a in, in a different experimental way as well, uh, and that is to highlight that they're uh, indeed in inhibiting uh, the formation of biofilm. Not only that, the underlying molecular mechanisms of formation of biofilms has to be studied more, so that we understand that which uh, of those uh, protein functioning or enzymatic actions and going a bit farther, uh, which of the DNA or their expressions are important in the formation of biofilm. As you see here, I highlighted that when you are treating them with uh, carprofen, you see that the smooth biofilm uh, texture has gone to a more like a crease. And that is uh, seen using a confocal uh, microscope, uh, where you see that the phenotype is, is changing. And you can uh, also see with our control experiment that at that concentration of the drug, they're not showing uh, much difference in the viability of those cells. So we haven't affected the viability of the uh, bacterial cells when we are treating with the drug. However, we uh, saw that the formation of biofilms are either getting inhibited or getting disrupted um, and, and their phenotype is changing. Now, in terms of biofilm, what is important for us to really understand that um, 
extra polymeric substances, um, the, the secretion of a bacterial cell when they're forming colonies, uh, when they're forming communities, and, and in, uh, in longer term, they're forming biofilm for getting clinical benefits that they can resist against the, uh, against the host immune system or they can resist uh, the antibiotic attack. So here you see that we extracted proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates from those biofilm cells. Uh, and here you can see that um, there, there is a significant difference in the carbohydrate level. Uh, and that is where we are currently working on that. What are the endogenous mechanisms for getting targeted? And what are the important genes involved in carbohydrate metabolism in mycobacteria? However, I wouldn't say that there was any, uh, any significance in the change in the protein or lipid. But that will be our next priority to investigate that if there is any uh, molecular mechanisms are getting affected by the treatment of carprofen. And at that stage, we realized that it is important to take a more of a holistic uh, approach. Uh, and, uh, and that is where the gene ex expression comes. So we um, exposed um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, in presence of uh, different concentrations of carprofen. Uh, and we obviously used other non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs as like ibuprofen and ketoprofen. Um, we also used anti TB drugs like isoniazid and rifampicin as a control. We treated them over a period of time. And obviously, you uh, will have those questions that what how did we determine the concentration of the drug and how long we expose that drug to to see if there is any influence um, uh, in, in their endogenous gene expression pattern. Uh, obviously, we spend a lot of time to optimize that. And I'm very happy to answer any question comes later on uh, and happy to collaborate if there is any uh, future possibilities coming up to work together. But here to focus on the results we have, which is very, uh, very surprising. But we see if you look at um, the table, you will see that um, unlike uh, ibuprofen and carprofen, uh, uh, ketoprofen, carprofen is um, influencing more than 1,000 uh, genes. So there are about 4,500 genes in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, so more than 1,000 genes are getting influenced, either getting upregulated or downregulated uh, to the exposure of carprofen. Whereas you see that isoniazid only target around 62, rifampicin are targeting around 250, three endogenous uh, gene expression pattern. So that is interesting because um, obviously when we think about designing or discovering a new antibiotic, uh, our attempt, if you remember uh, one of the initial slides where I said that we expect a novel mechanism of action, but at the same time, we expect that that endogenous uh, mechanism of action um, should be pleiotropic. Uh, what I meant by that is if a drug, if an antibiotic is targeting one particular gene expression, one enzyme activity, uh, one particular pathway, then antibiotic resistance development will be inevitable. Well, in any case, antibiotic resistance development is inevitable. So we need to really challenge the bug, superbugs, to make sure that the resistance development is getting delayed. We need to involve public practice uh, to make sure that uh, as far as we can push that to make sure that the antibiotic resistance are not developing immediately. And here we see the prospect of using uh, carprofen because uh, more than 1,000 genes are getting um, uh, influenced by the exposure of carprofen. Um, and even more interestingly, you will see that uh, those 1,000 genes which are getting influenced by carprofen are not overlapping with the in uh, with the genes getting influenced by any of the anti-TB uh, drugs like isoniazid, the frontline anti-TB drugs like isoniazid uh, or rifampicin. What does that mean? That means that we can actually use this um, molecule to treat isoniazid resistance patient or rifampicin resistant patients. But also, in addition to that, um, the, the, their targets are uh, very different. So uh, there will be less uh, interaction or conflict uh, with the existing anti-TB drugs. And that is what is in line with the clinician's work in vivo, where uh, we found that they're showing some synergistic effect with the anti-TB uh, drugs. So uh, obviously, I will not have time to explain that how we do those RNA extraction, uh, ran those real-time PCR uh, or RT-PCR. At the same time, we did uh, microarray analysis um, and, uh, and how we identified what is very important here to focus on. I'm sure that next 20 years um, of my research will be very much focusing on if I 
hopefully I get time to really work on all those aspects, or at least I could engage more of you to join in this collaborative effort to find out uh, all these um, endogenous targets, uh, which I highlighted, are involved either in respiration or in lipid metabolism or in uh, transport mechanisms are getting significantly upregulated or downregulated. So individually they are involved in different uh, metabolic pathways and to understand those metabolic pathways in mycobacterium tuberculosis you need to clone express purify those proteins use those uh, structural biology approaches uh, rosalind franklin and uh, jd barnell for example her employer the first head of department in uh, the department of biological sciences at barbeck university of london took uh, to use the structural biology approach to understand those endogenous mechanisms understand those endogenous molecular machineries so that we know that how uh, a new antibiotic we are designing planning to design or discover will interact with them more in detail so here is a preliminary data and here is a, a part which is still not published so um, we took two different approaches uh, where you can see uh, that we are highlighting uh, the fact that one of those endogenous uh, mechanisms uh, lsr2 lsr2 uh, is um, a regulatory protein um, which is involved in multiple cellular processes, including cell wall biogenesis and antibiotic resistance, as you can see from this uh, publication. Um, we found that that LSR2 uh, got hugely influenced by the exposure of um, uh, carprofena. So therefore, uh, we took two strategies. One strategy was uh, to, uh, to buy, bind carprofen to a resin and then run through um, uh, the drug carprofen uh, on the, um, sorry, the, LS, the protein LSR2 on the other strategy where we bind uh, LSR2 to the resin and run carprofen together. Now, the first strategy, frustratingly, um, uh, did not work. And that is uh, a fact about research. So you come up with a lot of enthusiasm, you plan, design, experiments and often that does not work here is a live example uh, where we see that carprofen has got an intrinsic fluorescence property so therefore it is very difficult to really uh, use differential scanning uh, fluorimetry to differentiate the signal the fluorescence signal you get from carprofen and the fluorescence signal you get from carprofen when they bound to lsr2 so therefore that strategy uh, is void. So we moved on to the pull down assay, and I will show you very preliminary data. Don't uh, really um, uh, take uh, anything from here. I'm sure that we need to interpret it more. But in our other pull down assay, where we bound uh, the LSR2 uh, first to the resin, and then we ran carprofen, um, uh, here you can see. Um, we found that LSR2 and carprofen are appearing uh, as a kind of together in this pull down assay. And that really encouraged us to, obviously I need to engage more students uh, on this particular project and their contribution is vital here uh, to understand that uh, whether this LSR2 um, uh, is, uh, can be uh, a target for carprofen. And on that note, I think, by now, we uh, were able to clone, express, and purify LSI2 from mycobacterium tuberculosis. Carprofen is already there, and the advantage of that is, is it is an existing um, molecule. Anyone can buy carprofen from, uh, from a superstore over the over-the-counter medicine. So, uh, so that is where we are continuing uh, to understand. The paper you will see uh, coming up online next week, and there will be a press release on that because this is a very um, uh, important work. We found that immunomodulatory drugs can be uh, really repurposed. So therefore, I would really urge you to go and, uh, and follow our research and see that uh, what is coming up next week on this particular um, uh, article, where you will see that I haven't actually said that we uh, were able to generate carprofen resistant mutant in mycobacteria. We, uh, and, and legitimately, we did didn't say that because we um, we are still unable to generate carprofen resistant mutant in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And here comes to uh, a model. Here comes to uh, a method which we developed in our lab. Um, and the model is mycobacterium aurum. You can see that we sequenced the whole genome of mycobacterium aurum a couple of uh, years ago in collaboration with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine next door to us. Uh, and we found that uh, after uh, a long um, effort, we are able to generate um, uh, a mutant of 
um, Mycobacterium aurum against carprofen. And that is a, a, a beginning of a new era because once we have these mutants, we are able to extract the genomic DNA. Uh, because we are able to sequence both the wild type and the mutant, we will be able to compare and that will reveal um, uh, more of their endogenous gene target. And that can be compared with the RNA targets, which we already revealed uh, using our transcriptomic uh, analysis and will give us more confidence that this immunomodulatory drugs can be uh, repurposed um, uh, in, in a more effective way to treat tuberculosis. Uh, obviously, the color change, if you have noticed in the mutant, has got some clinical relevance as well. And that is uh, for me to speak uh, another day. Now, I, this is my final slide. And I'd like to say that, uh, obviously, uh, we came up with a lot of enthusiasm a couple of years ago when serendipitously in 2009, I discovered that carprofen is showing anti-tubercular specific uh, activity. A, a molecule which is showing uh, immunomodulatory action and loads of research uh, has been done on that molecule. It was exciting for me to think that, okay, we can repurpose this molecule uh, to treat tuberculosis. But over this uh, decade of our research, we realized that uh, obviously we need to step back and do more fundamental medicinal chemistry research uh, to find out that how we create a balance between uh, their immunomodulatory action and their anti-infective action. So therefore, in collaboration with UCL Chemistry, we are already able to make uh, several analogs of this carprofen molecule. There our attempt is obviously to make them more anti-tubercular and we care slightly less about their, well, I should not say that, but maybe um, to, to have a better balance to make sure that they're showing uh, more effective uh, anti-tubercular property. And I need to remind you two things here, because I think the previous speaker brilliantly uh, identified um, an effect of an antibiotic on our natural flora. And that is uh, an ongoing issue and a problem, because whenever you use antibiotic, you need to use antibiotic, uh, because you cannot ban antibiotic uh, for so many other uh, health conditions. Um, and, uh, and when a clinician use antibiotic, it is important for us, like a fundamental researcher, to really think about how that antibiotic is delivered, how that antibiotic is delivered to the primary site of infection. And when it comes, I think from our pharmaceutical uh, understanding and knowledge, we, are, we always try to uh, use nanoparticles to formulate that molecule to make sure that that drug molecule is well protected, hidden inside that uh, formulation so that they're not uh, showing any much, much side effect at the stage, at the stage when they were delivered. Also, uh, the way to deliver them to the primary site of infection. In this case, say um, tuberculosis is a lung infection. So therefore, instead of taking a drug orally so that they will go to the gut and will affect the gut microflora in the first instance, if they were uh, delivered straight to the lung using a nebulizer, that is a strategy which uh, we are taking on in collaboration with University Putra, Malaysia. Their medicinal chemistry uh, department is extremely strong. And we are generating those analogs to make sure that some of those analogs has got medicinal chemistry property, which can be formulated better than others. And as I said, that we need to uh, have a good balance between their immunomodulatory function uh, with their anti-infective mode of action. So I will summarize. Um, we, um, I mean, whatever uh, time I had, I shared that carprofen inhibits mycobacterial efflux pump mechanism, and this inhibition is reversible. Carprofen disrupts the formation of mycobacterial biofilm by modulating extra polymeric substances. You saw that you have seen that carbohydrate level was significantly modulated. Uh, there is no doubt. The others we need to work on more. There is a large number of uh, genes which are either getting upregulated or downregulated by um, uh, the exposure of carprofen, uh, and uh, and there is no overlap with uh, their endogenous target uh, with the endogenous target of any of the first line anti TB drugs, and that is remarkable. Uh, now, this is the first report of carprofen, which you will see next week uh, in a Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, pub getting published, uh, is a likely candidate amongst all other common non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, which we could repurpose um, uh, as an adjunct chemotherapy to treat uh, tuberculosis. So um, I should not really leave this conversation without acknowledging uh, my uh, PhD students, uh, postdocs, uh, embrace global infectious diseases students. They're relentlessly working. Even uh, during this COVID-19 challenge, uh, they are still working in the lab uh, and continuing slightly neglected aspect of this 
uh, our pandemic, uh, obviously our focus uh, gone shifted to um, COVID-19 over last um, uh, few months. Uh, however, uh, I think the research I presented to you, you would agree with me that how important it is to tackle antibiotic resistance uh, by uh, uh, clever designing of new uh, antibiotics and how we should really focus and refocus uh, on our strategies uh, to tackle antibiotic resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, my collaborators. Now, Professor Helen Hells um, is a professor of um, chemical biology. Um, um, professor uh, Mark Lipman is a clinician uh, who works for NA in the UK, uh, and then Dr. Simon Waddle uh, from Brighton and Sussex Medical School uh, is a, a transcriptomic specialist in the field of TB, and Professor Tim Mackew, who is in Royal Free Hospital, uh, is a, a medi medical microbiologist. Uh, and they are the primary collaborators who actually contributed uh, to this particular project I presented to you. But without uh, the help of many other collaborators uh, in the UK, in India, and many other places, uh, this work, uh, it, it does not make much sense. Because as I said, interdisciplinarity uh, and international collaboration are key to uh, uh, our success of uh, generating some, uh, uh, some threat to this, uh, these uh, superbugs. Um, and uh, finally, uh, last but not the least, uh, is the generous support we had from Wellcome Trust, from Medical Research Council, uh, UK, and many other uh, international program. I would highlight SM Duo uh, program, British Council and Commonwealth, uh, which are um, going on currently ongoing between India and, and my lab. So uh, that is uh, something which I'm sure that encouraging for us to uh, uh, for, for us to uh, think and uh, think about how um, we could generate some um, some overlap, uh, some uh, complementarity in our research to develop more, build more uh, international collaboration. Okay, I, I'm on my last slide, and I say that uh, how international research capacity building is uh, so important uh, to tackle antibiotic resistance or to tackle any other global challenges, uh, and we had a successful uh, workshop last year in July. Obviously, this year, for due to COVID-19, we could not gather. I can, you can see that how amazing these people were. You can see Professor Anindra Sundar Ghosh from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur, was there. Uh, Professor Franz Booker from Austria was with us. Uh, Professor Gabriel Waxman, I'm sure that if you type by uh, all green uh, uh, things are small, I think I hashtagged in my social media uh, page. Uh, she, uh, he is a fellow of Royal Society. Uh, and uh, took an uh, initiative to uh, to really encourage such webinars uh, instead of um, kind of uh, traveling around the world and obviously meeting face to face is uh, is a brilliant thing uh, but uh, also we need to be uh, really um, concerned about the carbon footprints which we are uh, generating day by day. Uh, and here you see Professor Esther Boyes from Barcelona. Uh, here you see Institute Pasteur uh, representation and uh, loads of other people came from Ghana uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Professor uh, Simon Waddle uh, there. Uh, and, and my students are uh, over there, my collaborators are there. Um, so this year we are hoping to organize this workshop sometime uh, between now and uh, December. Uh, and that is funded by Global uh, Challenges Research Fund. Uh, so if that is happening, obviously I will let you know through uh, the coordinator to the convener of this conference so that you can come and join us uh, and, uh, and join force so that we can uh, together tackle antibiotic resistance in global infectious diseases. I don't know whether I'm, um, I took too much time. Um, my time is up. I have spoken enough, uh, but the interaction is very important. So I look forward to receive any question you have, and I'm very happy to answer now or later. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sir, such enlightening presentation of yours and many more things that were totally unknown and we have known from you. And that is a bliss from uh, for us that we have uh, witnessed your such enlightening presentation. And uh, so now we have uh, some questions are here, many questions are there, but two to three, I will uh, to, uh, just forward you. And uh, one participant, Shongram Shinha, he is asking that, is it really diminishing the carbohydrate content in the biofilm or glycosylation is minimized? Well, I think um, the the assay result I have shown, they are very preliminary. So there we used a fundamental um, uh, lab uh, practices where you just estimate the uh, total protein 
the estimate the total carbohydrate, estimate the total lipid content of uh, a drug treated and untreated cells. Uh, so basically the experiment is very simple where you um, uh, create a di uh, dry weight of uh, treated and untreated sample, extract and, and use the classical technique to estimate carbohydrate, protein and, and lipid. So therefore it will be impossible for me to tell at this stage that whether they are targeting any of the in, uh, any of the more complicated uh, steps of carbohydrate metabolism. Um, what you saw is uh, the effect on a total carbohydrate level, and that difference is significant. So very possible that uh, there is a change in the uh, in, in the structure or function of uh, many of those pathways which are involved in carbohydrate metabolism. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, next question from him also that uh, can inhibitor of prokaryotic glycosylation inhibitor could prohibit biofilm formation and soda pathogen? Well, I think I think he's asking um, too many good questions. I think th this is this is a good question, uh, but I do not know the answer. I think uh, I think one has to perform them and see that whether they do. We have got a, a fantastic model to test uh, any drug, any new molecule, or any inhibitors on the formation of biofilm. So uh, clearly, there is a possibility that we can test them and see that whether they do. Uh, affect the biofilm formation in mycobacteria or not, unless the, uh, the, the question asker knows them uh, from their own experience. I, I'm not sure uh, at what level he works or she works, but you can, uh, you can, you can tell uh, them that I, uh, they can easily get in touch with me and we can see that whether we could do some work together. Surely, surely, sir. And uh, next question from uh, Shankho Nath. To combat bacterial biofilm, what is the development in research on anti-biofilm agents or drugs? Well, I think this is, um, um, I wouldn't say this is a new area because I, if it was 10 years ago, I would have said that this is an emerging area of understanding bacterial biofilm formation. And therefore, you can really see that whether that can be inhibited or disrupted. Um, uh, because strategically, I mean, this is a common sense that if, biof well, what is known, biofilm formation is vitally important for bacteria to escape from antibiotic pressure, uh, uh, escape from some of the uh, natural immune uh, attack um, inside the host cell. So there is no doubt that inhibiting biofilm or disrupting biofilm is a good strategy. Now, how much do we know about bacterial biofilm? When we say about bacterial biofilm, it comes about gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and I uh, highlighted um, only acid fast group of bacteria called tuberculosis or leprosy, right? And those different bacteria, they have different cell wall architectures. They have got different metabolic pathways to form the cell wall and form those machineries which are involved in the formation of biofilm. So, and, and there we know very little. We do not, we only know that mycobacterium tuberculosis can form biofilm, but what are the endogenous mechanisms or machineries involved? in influencing uh, a formation of a biofilm and how that can be inhibited. That is a research we are very much interested to pursue. Sorry, sir, your sound is not coming now, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it is audible, sir. Okay, okay, so I, I don't know whether, did I answer that question or you could not hear me? Yeah, just uh, the last portion that you mentioned, the first portion was right. Just right, okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so basically uh, I said that uh, in short, uh, we still need to understand the molecular machineries and, uh, and those genes or gene expressions are vital to the formation of biofilm. Now, those different pathways and endogenous mechanisms are involved in biofilm formation are also unique in different bacterial pathogens. So one has to spend a lot of time uh, to understand what are those mechanisms in gram positives and gram negatives. And as we are uh, uh, contributing in the field of acid fast group of bacteria, we still uh, are not aware of all those endogenous mechanisms involved in biofilm formation. Once um, we have a better idea, then we should be able to design more strategic inhibitor against those mechanisms, and then they will be um, uh, as kind of contributor to the inhibition of biofilm formation. Here, I think uh, one thing you would have noticed that uh, in our drug design or discovery strategies, we have taken more of a wholesale approach. Now, 
there are two ways you can approach. One is to really go into the endogenous mechanisms where you would like to study the gene expression, you'd like to study uh, individual enzyme, enzymatic function, uh, and how they influence different uh, molecular machineries and, and the cell, cellular functioning. And then in, for a drug designer or for a drug discoverer, you can actually target those and develop inhibitors. The strategy we have taken, and that is more of a um, um, more of a mixed modern strategies where actually your vital question is at a whole cell environment, you care fast that whether an inhibitor is inhibiting this uh, intrinsic mechanism of drug resistance development. Before uh, you know, if you go on to those um, individual mechanisms, you spend 10 years or 20 years, and then later on you find out that in fact there are some molecular interaction challenges which are not letting you to contribute uh, to, the, to the field. So in reality, I think our stage one is to see that if any inhibitor is um, is affecting the whole cell mechanism of antibiotic resistance, as you see on drug efflux pump inhibition, uh, on um, biofilm formation. And then once you, once we identified some of those hits, then we optimize them as a novel lead to go on and, and understand that what could be the endogenous uh, target for those inhibitors. So this is an interesting area and that is where I think um, um, encouragingly, uh, we are joining hands to work more, uh, to, to reveal more about these mechanisms. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, one more last question, sir. Uh, that is uh, from uh, Sharan Gupta. And that is any plant based drugs present as an alternative to these drugs? If so, which was is more potent, the natural drugs or NSAIDs? Um, okay, so that's an interesting question. I think, I think we are talking about combination therapy. Uh, so when we talk about potency, you think about an antibiotic, um, and and you think about their ability to uh, to kill a bacteria inside the host. Um, and mainly here, uh, wh when you think about immunomodulatory drug, we are not thinking about replacing the existing anti TB drugs at all, because they're not potent enough to be used just as they are to treat tuberculosis. We are thinking about developing a, a more effective combination therapy where those non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs with their dual activities, like with their immunomodulatory activity as well as their anti-infective anti activities, they, they could be uh, used as an adjunct to the existing therapy and could have a more effective end point of that treatment. Because you know that the treatments are available, but uh, when people are taking those drugs for six months or even up to two years in MDR-TB cases, uh, endpoints has to be more defined so that we can minimize the relapse of the uh, same disease. We uh, also need to be mindful that those uh, patients are not developing antibiotic resistance against that treatment strategy we have. So whether they're more or less, I think the question here is how we could really create a better combination of those therapeutics so that we can tackle this particular infectious disease more effectively and in a more logical uh, way. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And... Uh... There are other several questions that I will surely forward to you. Uh, and so uh, thanks for your timing and the busy schedule that you have crossed and let the time to our uh, this conference. And also I mentioned to the participants and all the other resource person that the gene expression, the momentous keyword during this century, the Saji, the firstly we have uh, planned during this decade, but the correction was made by self Professor Dr. Shonji Bokto, and he has uh, secretly mentioned about uh, this century. So this was so much relevant, and thanks to him for nice suggestion. Thank you so much, Professor Bokto. Thank you. Thanks once again. Okay, thank you so much. I hope that uh, you wouldn't mind if I leave this meeting because I have to go for another appointment. So um, I'm, I'm sure that um, I, I kind of appreciate your patience and uh, and listening to our research. 
any question or any opportunities we have, uh, do get in touch with me because uh, we are quite visible, uh, not only on uh, the internet, but also um, through our uh, public funded research, we are quite uh, obliged to uh, kind of put up our research and outreach to the public. So I'd really appreciate if you follow our research uh, on any of the social media we have, um, Facebook as well as Twitter uh, and, uh, and comment and make sure that um, uh, we kind of meet the need for the public uh, the money we are using for our research and make sure that we are on track. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd really like to say bye to you and I wish you all the best uh, for all your, um, uh, all your work you are doing. And thanks again to the, uh, to the organizing committee for this webinar uh, to, to put all this uh, together so nicely. And a special thank before I go uh, to Dr. Arpita Sharnakar, because I think um, she kind of, um, we, we uh, met almost two decades ago, and I'm sure that um, in this uh, particular situation, uh, it is more re relevant that we uh, are more together, we are working more together, we do everything more together, more collaboratively to make things more successful. So, okay, uh, bye for now, and I'm sure that we will stay in touch. Thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you so much. Please stay in touch. Thank you so much. So now it's time for the next presentation. We are already going uh, running beyond the time, uh, though our next speaker is Dr. Shobhik Mukherjee from National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Tolani, India. So now it's time to hear Dr. Shobhik Mukherjee. He, is, uh, he has already joined. So I would uh request dr mukherjee yeah uh, so dr mukherjee is visible now and now our one of colleagues dr biplob bakshi assistant professor in botany department of botany bongobashi college will introduce dr mukherjee so biplob sir thank, thank you argo yes a very good evening to everybody it is a great pleasure for me to introduce dr shobhik mukherjee University of Calcutta. His research interests on human molecular genomics, microbiome, and potential role in human health, genomics of communicable and non communicable diseases, population genetics, and molecular evolution. He carried on postdoctoral research in an Indo Spanish collaborative project. He has published papers in high impact peer reviewed many national and international journals. He has presented his work in more than 30 national and international conferences and has authored a couple of book chapters on the role of human skin and gut microbiome in human health. He is a life member of Indian Society of Human Genetics and Calcutta Consortium on Human Genetics. He has been honored with many awards from USA, Japan, Singapore, and certainly from India. He will talk on involvement of innovative immunity, genes and gut lung, metagenomic axis in maintenance of human health <clears throat> in the COVID-19 era. So I will request Dr. Mukherjee to deliver his nice lecture. Thank you. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I hope that you are able to see the screen that I have shared and uh, yeah, it is yeah. audible and uh, you are audible and visible also and the screen Thank is you. also visible. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir. Yeah, so, so the point is that uh, I have to uh, hurry because uh, the time slot that was given to me is already over. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I had a, do I had a few few slide deck, but I, I but I, I'm not sure I will be able to present all of them because I have some other uh, you know other types of uh, work also. Yeah, so um, cu cutting the story short, I, I'm very much grateful that uh, I have been in, invited in this uh, webinar, and webinars are now the new normal, and uh, you know the humankind is now combating this pandemic uh, COVID-19. And so I thought that with this opportunity, when Dr. Orgo uh, actually uh, you know, invited me to join this uh, webinar, the, the thing that enticed me the most is that the way that we are going to communicate with uh, people 
from different parts of the world. And I also found that uh, there are some eminent speakers. So I have all also uh, been here hearing some of them. And uh, one of them, Dr. Oshim Tattarai, I have uh, shared one conference uh, with him in the Amity University. And sir, I am quite enticed by the work that you do. I have heard you in 2019, I th 18, I think, in Amity University. So I thought that this is a chance that I will again like to hear him. So my uh, area of interest is uh, microbiome, the human microbiome in health and disease. And uh, when you talk about the human microbiome, you have to also talk about the human immune system. So the, the heading of my talk is the involvement of innate immunity genes and the, the gut lung metagenomic axis in the maintenance of human health. I could have stopped here. But since we are now in the COVID-19 pandemic era, I thought that, uh, you know, without explaining my work, because my work you will be able to see in the internet, you, you'll be able to see in the, you know, in my journals and all. So I would also include some of the research that is happening in, in this area of the innate immunity genes and the microbiome in the COVID-19 era. There are some people who tell about the post-COVID era, but I don't think we are into the post-COVID era. We are actually into the COVID era, and we surely hope that we will soon be reaching the post-COVID era. So while we talk about the innate immunity genes, uh, they are long thought, termed as the unsung he he heroes of immunity. Uh, you know, they more than 90% of the pathogens, but yet the research on the innate immunity genes are very few. Most of the, the research is, uh, you know, heading towards the adaptive immunity genes, MHC and T helper cells and all. But please acknowledge the fact that the innate immune system is the unsung hero. They keep you healthy for more than 90% of, of the times and uh, you fall ill for a very short period of time. So why study the innate immunity genes? When we started our work on the innate Im immunity genes, this question came up. And uh, the answer is that although the innate immune system is the most ancient form of host response genes that have de developed before the vertebrates and invertebrates, so the vertebrates only have the adaptive immune system. Every other animals and every other organism have something called the innate immune system. So that is very important. It plays a vital role in the microbial recognition and activation of immune system and it can also help in you know ter terminating infections invertebrates solely depend on the innate immune system so being evolutionarily ancient this innate immune system may be considered to be optimized by natural selection since it is a very ancient form of uh, immune system genes some people thought that they are optimized by natural selection and everything is now you know fixed there but it has been also emphasized by peter parham that uh, you know this innate immune system has the capacity to prevent primary infections from actually causing a disease. And there, therefore, uh, if you can remember Holden's hypothesis, those uh, genes which are actually at the interface of the host pathogen co-evolution should also be evolving along with the e evolution of the pathogens. Based on that, we did some st study and it was, uh, you know, that time when not much attention was given to the uh, evolution of the innate immunity genes. We studied the cell surface receptors, primarily the toll-like receptors. Some of them are intracellular also, uh, the secreted polypeptides and the membrane-bound glycoproteins. We found that when we studied an urban Indian population, we found that more than 548 vari variants we, we identified, of which more, more than 200 variants were not found in DBSNP. So we submitted these more than 200 SNPs or more than 200 SNVs to the NCBI. So Indian population is not there in the 1,000 th genomes or in many other, other, other uh, worldwide initiatives to characterize the human genome. <clears throat> so when we work on the human genome in the Indian population, we actually find out very much novel SNPs or novel SNVs. We strive to think that why these SNVs are there. So we did some evolutionary work. If innate immunity gene is all already redundant and it is already fixed, then uh, so many variations are not expected. So we did some study on the natural selection of the innate Im immunity genes. And this uh, research that we published in TNS is 
one of the pioneering work did during my PhD times, and uh, uh, you know it has received more than 89 citations uh, till date, which is itself a proof that this type of work was not done during that time. And uh, since then, I'm enticed with innate Im immunity genes. <clears throat> when I started my work in NIBMG, I thought that we had studied only the Indian po population. During that time, the thousand gen genomes has come. And uh, that time, the th thousand genome population was at the phase one. Now it is in the phase two. The phase one had the whole human genomes of the healthy individuals from 14 different continental populations 1091 individuals whole genome were there and i had the indian whole genomes of the populations that i studied so i increased uh, the you know study repertoire i had an urban indian pop population that i previously did during my phd and other than that i also included two tribal populations bisonon maria and Ir irula why i included these tribal populations because as you know the tribals and the hunter gatherers they are the nomadic tribes. They don't live in cities. They are not connected by, you know, this sewage and water tanks. So epidemics don't happen in them. It is only after agriculture fl flourished and we, we learned how to irrigate and all these malaria, measles and all types of civilization pathogens, they came. And the concept of epidemics and pandemics came from there. So now we can very well understand what I am saying, that since we are so much connected, this COVID-19 has spread into all parts of the world. It also it originated just in China. Had we still been hunter-gatherers and we were not mixing with, with, with each other so much, this uh, epidemic would not, this pandemic would not have spread. So the uh, genomic architecture of the hunter-gatherers and the nomadic tribes and the urbans, they are not same. Now you will say that you are collecting the samples from the, the present day time. So how do you find the impact or the imprint of the genomic imprint uh, during the times of the you know advent of agriculture so i would like to mention that although there is no scope to to explore and to show you how we do it there are some statistical simulation studies by which you can actually go back to the most recent common ancestor and also do some statistical analysis by which you will be able to find out the genomic imprint that was there in the natural the natural selection imprints and if you will understand that the imprints of the natural selection, it takes a huge amount of time. After it has been imprinted, it again takes a huge amount of time to go, go back. So it is only 11,000 years now that the agriculture has flourished. So the natural selection imprints are still there in the Maria and the Irula. We did some studies and these are some of the analysis that we do. These are the rate of change of non-synonymous by synonymous mutations called DNDS and in some other kinds of uh, interactions I could have explored more on this we compared with the racist monkey with the gibbon with the chimpanzee and we also compared for you all these populations starting from Africa America Asia among them specifically we, we had the Indian populations and also the Europeans so more than 1091 individuals from the thousand genomes and uh, three populations uh, comprising of more than 250 odd individuals from India. This is a, called a, a new type of analysis called extended haplotype homozygosity analysis, where you simulate the neutral evolution. This, this blue line is the neutral evolution. And the other lines that, that are there, they are actually the LD plots, the linkage disequilibrium plots of the neighboring SNPs in the whole genome of all the world populations. We found that mostly in the two populations, TLR2 and TLR4, these two genes in all the populations were having strongest signatures of natural selection. And quite obvious because as you can see, TLR2 and TLR4, they are actually recognizing the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So if you go back to our Holden's hypothesis, those you know, genes that are at the interface of, of the host pathogen coevolution are, are always evolving. So we also found that global footprints of the purifying selection on toll-like receptor genes that are primarily associated with the red response to bacterial infections in humans. And uh, we identified a particular haplotype in the TLR4 gene. That haplotype is found only in the European populations and has been previously postulated to be absent in Asians and Americans. 
but we found that this particular haplotype that is giving a selective ad advantage over the malarial parasite is, is pre present in uh, India, both in the hunter gatherers and in the, uh, in the urban populations. <clears throat> so while we were doing these association st studies, uh, what we are actually trying to find out when we do the genetic association studies, we try to find out the missing her heritability. And I'm interested in only complex type of disorders. I'm not interested in infectious disease or cancer. I have shifted my gears to the complex type of diseases, which are mostly like, uh, you know, metabolic syndromes and all. So while we do all these genetic association studies, uh, if, if we go back to the history of the genomics, we find that all the uh, research is hinting at only a single point. That is, we are trying to find out the missing heritability of this complex type of disorders. So during that time when we were doing our PhD, one hypothesis was there. It's called the common disease, common variant hypothesis, the CDCV hypothesis. What does it mean? It means that suppose a person is in Africa, a person is in Europe, he's in America, uh, in India. If they are having the same type of diseases, then the variant that has to be associated with that, that disease has to be common across all the populations. It's quite intuitive. It's quite acceptable. And uh, you can explain it to any, anybody and that person can agree. So this hypothesis was then very much rock solid that the common disease, common variant hypothesis was there. And that was the era of the candidate gene stud studies and the GWASs, genome-wide association studies. So uh, the candidate gene study is something like this. You are trying to fi find out a key. A key is lost. But you have a hypothesis that this is the area under the lamppost that you are going to study. So those studies were mostly hypothesis driven. Those studies were mostly ba based on some previous studies done on the same type of research. And they also had some selection pressure, some bias of selection by the lab, by the PI, or by the school of thought that the researchers are engaged. So if I believe that innate immunity genes are most important, I will always sequence the innate immunity genes and try to find out the positive agent of all diseases. But that may not be true. The key may be somewhere else. But actually, we are driven by our hypothesis. We are actually searching in a small area. Those were the candidate gene days. And when I say those were the candidate genes, gene, gene days, it's not 1970s or 80s, my dear friends. I'm not that old. <laughs> so this was during 2003 and 4. This was in the new millennium. So the field of genomics or the field of genetics is very new. So don't think when I'm telling those were the days, it's 1970s. It's just 2003 and 4 when candidate gene studies were being done and were being you know, accepted by good journals. So how do we do this study? We used to do this study by a sequencing method called Sanger sequencing. And this person, Frederick Sanger, has done wonders. He has won two Nobel Prizes. And he is actually a person from proteomics, if some of, some of you may know. He has actually invented protein sequencing and got a Nobel Prize. After that, he invented DNA sequencing. He got another Nobel Prize. And both these Nobel Prizes, you know, changed the face of both proteomics and genomics. Genomics got a havoc chain because now you can easily sequence the uh, genes. You could not sequence the genome at that time, but you can sequence the gene. So this was invented in 1977. And, and uh, up till two, 2005 or six, that was the only method that we knew how to do genomic sequencing. So it existed for a long period of time. And uh, by this method, this is a Sanger sequencer. This is not the old Sanger sequencer that we had in our labs. This is a new Sanger sequencer that we now have in our lab in NIBMG. So as you can see, everything is now shrinking. So this Sanger sequencer is also very small. You can sequence. Previously, you could have sequenced 500 to 600 to 700 bases in each Sanger run. Now you can actually sequence from more than one KB in a single run. And still date, still date if new, new technologies have come, but Sanger sequencing has remained the gold standard. Anything that you get from other, other kinds of platforms, you have to validate it in Sanger sequencing. If you cannot validate it in Sanger sequencing, my dear friend, that will not be accepted in any good journal. 
So Sanger sequences are like this. We will have AT, G, and Cs have different, four different colors, four different fluorescence, fluorophores. I'm not going to explain Sanger sequencing in detail. Those were the days when we used to sequence the candidate genes. But as you can see, since the, the, those type of things were hypothesis driven, most of the times we, we did not find the associated loci. So then came the era of genome wide genotyping or genome wide association studies. Those were not hypothesis driven. Those were based on genome wide genotyping. It was not genome wide sequencing at that time, but genome wide genotyping in microarray platforms. So you are lighting up all the lampposts, wherever the key is, you are going to find it out. So how did this genome wide gen genotyping chips evolve? The microarray chips, they came, they had the probes for all the SNPs that are previously found by some researchers or the other. So what was done is something called LD blocks. The linkage disequilibrium blocks were actually computed across the whole genome. And as you can see here, if you can see my cursor, these uh, five SNPs, one, two, three, four, and five, the numbers in, in the che checker boxes are 98, 94, 97, and so on. This is actually 0 0.98, 0 0.94, and so on. So it is very high correlation. It is having very high LD, linkage disequilibrium. That means when you find the SNP1, the, the uh, confidence of finding SNP2 along with SNP1 is more than 98%. So what they have done is they have now devised a chip for all these five SNPs, the chips, and you allow them to hybridize. If the SNP is present, your gene of interest or that particular position of that gene will actually be high hybridized. And there are some fluorescence attached chemistry by which this Illumina iScan is actually a barcode reader. So it can read the, from those uh, gene coordinates what SNPs are present in your pop population. And then you, that can be converted to gene, genotypes and you can do all sorts of association studies based on that. So then came the genomics gold rush. It was in 2008 and 9 that these GWAS came and people had been doing G study. Every other, you know, ailment or disease, they started doing GWASs. And those who used to do GWAS in their PhD, we used to look up to them as they are doing some rocket science in genomics. That was the ultimate in genomics during that time. As you can see, you name a disease and you have it. You have a particular gene or a genomic locus attached to it. And uh, soon it became so large that they have to catalog. They have to float a website, a catalog of the GWAS studies. And... Uh, now you still will get this catalog. You can go, go back after this talk and find out this catalog of GWAS where you will be able to actually search for any type of, of disease. So those who does some meta analysis or systematic review, they actually go here and download all these. Suppose I'm going to do something on psoriasis. So I will write psoriasis. I'll get all of the, the GWAS is done on psoriasis. I will do some meta analysis and find out what are the genes that have been found several times? So then I don't have to do another GWAS. I have to just replicate that finding in the Indian population and see if those genes that are recurrently found associated in different populations are coming significant in our population or not. So this is also a very interesting website. If you go to this NHGRI web page, you will find that the genome-wide association studies that are now been, you know, these are all chromosomes. And these colorful uh, sur circular points are name of some, some diseases. The legions are given here. So each and every disease can be associated in all these chromosomes. This is in 2009. 658 GWAS studies have been published during that time. You go back to 2013, it becomes more busy. And just before this talk, I downloaded 2020. You can see the chromosomes are, can, are cannot be seen. I can go back 2009, 2013, 2020. Now every locus, every locus in the genome are now associated with each and every type of diseases. And the PP value is not 0 0.05. It is actually 5 into 10 to the power minus 8. Yet there are so many locuses in the genome that are found to be associated. 
However, after that, still we don't find the missing heritability of all diseases. Although we are doing candidate gene, GWAS and all sorts of things, yet we are not finding it out. So we have slowly now moved from the common disease, common variant hypothesis to a new hypothesis called common disease rare variant hypothesis, where the new type of sequencing has come, next generation sequencing. We call it massively parallel sequencing. What we now postulate is in Africa, in Europe, in America, in India, even if you have the same type of diseases, the positive genes may not be same because the ethnic background, the, the, the admixture, the population history, the ancestry, you know, everything is there. So the genomic background is, is not same. So you may not find the same associated gene. So you may find several rare variants. Those rare variants are very private and they are particular to a particular population or to a particular individual. So there comes the era of personalized medicine. So we come to this NGS era, common disease rare variant hypothesis. And this is the sequencer that is now doing the rounds. This is next generation sequencing. This is an Illumina sequencer. We call HiSec 2500 or HiSec 2000. In NIBMG, we have many of them. If some of you come to NIBMG someday, NIBMG has all sorts of next generation sequencers. Ion Torrent, HiSec, MySec, HiSec 2000, HiSec 2500. Now we have the largest genome sequencer, NovaSeq. We have two of them. So I don't think any government of India institute in India has got so many genomic sequencers under one roof. We have all of them in our place in NIBMG, in Kalyani. So here, you can appreciate, they can, they can sequence, you know, now they can sequence more than that. I am just giving you an idea. They can sequence initially 300 gigabases per run. This gigabase is the, not GB. It is not the GB of our USB drive. It is gigabases. If we recollect, the human genome is actually 3 billion bases, 3 into 10 to the power 9 bases. That is 3 GB. If the human genome is 3 GB, please appreciate this particular machine can sequence 100 X of one human genome in seven to eight days. And that we do a multiple times in, in our institute. If you know about the human genome project, it took 11 years to sequence one human genome. Now the technology has become such that you can sequence 100 human genomes in eight days. Well, uh, the first human genome was sequenced in a different way because that was the unknown thing. You didn't have a reference sequence in NCBI to go and design primers. They were done using the yaks and bats and they were done using chromosome walking. So uh, this is re-sequencing. I'll not go into the, the details of the sequencing. Uh, so all the common disease, common variant, common disease, rare variant, different types of NGS, uh, you know, has been done. Yet the missing heritability could not be found. You are now getting the particular, you name a disease. How much of missing heritability have, have you been able to explain? Not more than 25%. And what do you mean by missing heritability is that, that, that is the question with which uh, a, a diseased person comes to the clinician. That, sir, I have the disease. What is the probability that my children will have the same disease? That is called the heritability. So we are all running after the missing heritability prob problem. If we can fi find out what are the genes, then we can devise a chip and we can, we, we can actually screen the new, new, newborn for all diseases and find out if that newborn will have a disease or not. Now, at present, these chips are being done only on Mendelian or the monogenic types of diseases. For the complex kind of diseases, this is still a utopian. So why it is so? If you see complex type of diseases, you see there is not only a genotype disease correlation like in Mendel, Mendelian type of diseases. There are one genotype, there are some other genes, epistatic interactions, several sub phenotypes. Like you have a hypertension, you have sugar levels, you have, uh, you know, some ischemic heart disease. Many things together will form a disease state or a cardiovascular disease. So. This is the uh, phenotypes and, uh, and you have uh, several sub phenotypes, the genotype and other genes, and then you have the disease. So 
every time we are going to do all these things only the genes and genes and genes we have overlooked the environment there is also an environment component to it so without the environment component probably you cannot find out the missing heritability problem so now there are some studies that say the human microbiome is actually going to answer this missing heritability problem and the equation has now changed we don't talk of gwas now we talk of mwas metagenome wide association studies that's the new era that has now come so when we talk about microbiome what do we talk when which person has told the microbiome first it it was give the name was given by joshua lederberg and for those of you who don't know who joshua lederberg is he is the person who actually discovered conjugation during his phd and transduction during the first phd student in in his lab and aptly he was given the nobel prize in 1958 microbiome it is thought that microbiome is 90% of the cells in your body is microbial and 10% of cells are only human and that was doing the rounds due to some intricate calculations based on the volume of elementary canal to be 1 1 liter and the density of bacteria in per gram weight content of the gut is 10 to the power 11 there are some studies in 1970s that have estimated that so based on that calculation 10 to the power 11 into 1 liter it becomes 10014 cells and we all know that our cells are 10 to the power 13 so easily it is 1 is to 10 so actually all these slides that i have shown till now are actually looking into the 10% and trying to find out the missing heritability problem what about the 90% that is residing in your body so a human is not only one organism it is actually called a supra organism yes it's not super it's supra organism supra organism means a collection of organisms you are a collection of organisms more than 90% of of your cells are bacteria the human microbiome project not bacteria bacteria fungus virus several different kinds of microbes so that became the basis of the human bi- microbiome project like the thousand genomes project they did now they are, they have done the human microbiome project but after some time in 2016 some people challenged this notion and they said that no 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 it's not 90% it's actually 50 50 50% of your cells are microbial it's not 90% so so this this is a, that 1970 study that says that approximately 10 to the power 13 eukaryotic cells are there in adult human organism and they also say that 10 to the power 14 prokaryotic and eukaryotic microbial cells are present in our body this particular publication was the foundation of this 90% and 10% theory but now we know that our elementary canal is not 1 liter by ultrasound and many other technologies it is now known that the volume of elementary canal is 0.4 liters so the entire equation now gets changed it becomes 50 50 this is the study that has been done to prove that it is 50 50 it is 0.4 as you can see here it is 1 liter here it is 0.4 liter so even if it is 50 50 Uh, it is important if 50% of your body is somebody else you also need to study that somebody else along with your cells so microbiome is everywhere you name it and you have it nasal microbiome ocular microbiome oral microbiome skin mi- microbiome vaginal mi- microbiome now vaginal microbiome has got a very important uh, you know uh, you know aspect of the maternal health preterm things and all this pre- pregnancy related complications now vaginal microbiome is coming out a big way the gut microbiome has now become like jeevas it has been associated with anything and everything on earth you name a, a disease it has been associated but now we are moving beyond association we are moving beyond the microbiome in gut we have to also do different other kinds of microbiome our lab per se is doing something on skin microbiome we are studying innate immunity genes and also the skin microbiome <coughs> so while we talk about microbiome it is not only bacteria this bacteria archae eukaryota viruses several things and we have to also study the host genes so it's the host microbiome interactions that is important you should not do gwas only you should not do mwas only 
you should do both of them together host microbiome interactions so it's the individuals microbiome individuals food habits individuals genetic background that that is keeping the homeostasis of the health or if the homeostasis is broken it becomes a disease so the human microbiome project has been floated in 2008 and 9 during the times when we were doing jivas in india they were flo floating the uh, you know human mi microbiome project in broad institute j craig venter institute washington university and baylor college of medicine if you can read this abstract in genome research that they published in 2008 and 9 they told that they will do 250 250 non normal means healthy volunteers and they will find out the baseline baseline healthy microbiome so while they while we are doing microbiome sequencing we are actually sequencing 16s rrna gene the 16s rrna gene is why it is used in the as a candidate for microbiome because it it is present in almost all the bacteria and it is conserved the gene is conserved for long because it does a very housekeeping kind of a function and the gene is very small so also during sanger days people could sequence it is only 1.5 kb so three amplicons of sanger and the gene could be sequenced wholly now during ngs times we are using a peculiarity of this genetic architecture as you can see the cartoon this 16s gene has got a constant and variable regions c1 v1 v2 c2 these are con this constant regions c1 c2 c3 up to c9 these are actually 100% constant across the kingdom bacteria but the variable regions v1 v2 and v3 up to v9 these are not co constant across all the bacteria they are 97% per constant across the same genus 99% per percent constant across the same species and so on so this thing 95% across genus 97% across species was during that time when it was first started now we know after many many microbiome studies have come now we know that it is 97% is genus 95 9% species and 100% is strain level so microbiome sequencing since it, it does to a larger coverage and depth it does not need the entire gene to be sequenced it either sequences v1 to v3 so when we sequence v1 to v3 we actually do the primers on c1 to c3 if we have a primer in c1 and c3 all the bacteria even if it is unknown that can be sequenced so there are many many combinations you you can do v1 to v3 you can do v3 to v v5 and so on presently we do v3 to v4 in illumina so based on all these results of uh, the microbiome there is a ribosomal database project and these are the apps present in them you can download them in your smartphone and you can for a beginner they can actually do some analysis by clicking on this rdp and this rdp will do for few samples maybe 8 or 10 samples not more than that but when we do some workshops we actually show them like this it, you are getting more and more interested in into the microbiomes analysis during that time so after the human microbiome project is done several publications have been done among them the first one is this structure function and diversity of the healthy human microbiome and now the 16s amplicon sequencing is only for finding out who are there what are the bacteria present but it cannot give an idea why they are there because what is the function they are doing there what gene families are enriched in them what are the microbial pathways enriched in them that answer could not be given by 16s sequencing so slowly and slowly we are now moving into whole genome shotgun sequencing so there are two different methods now 16s it's like the jivas kind of thing association study and whole genome shotgun sequencing there you get the gene families and the pathways also now the new era is also of the meta transcriptomics you can do the transcriptomics the gene expression of the microbiome very few studies have been done in india we are trying to do some skin meta transcriptomics and we have not yet achieved success in that but we have successfully performed 16s and uh, this whole genome shotgun sequencing i'll skip some of the slides one slide uh, this slide is very important and this actually this publication enticed me the most why i started doing the microbiome because I, my background was genomics this study told that the healthy microbiome is not same for all 
when they did the gut microbiome of the hadza hunter gatherers in africa they found that when they compared with the healthy italian mi microbiome the gut microbiome of healthy italians and the gut microbiome of hadza hunter gatherers they found that the bifidobacterium lactobacillus all those kinds of beneficial bacteria that we turn from the european cohort they are actually absent in the healthy microbiome of the hadza hunter gatherers so all our science is always very eurocentric all the time we try to sequence the U europeans and try to say this is the reference sequence but no as i have also shown you that when we sequence the 170 indians in my phd we found more than 250 novels S snvs that we submitted to the dbsnp so unless you study the entire populations across the whole world you cannot have a reference Europeans cannot be the reference for the entire world and the microbiome is also showing that Bifidobacterium considered a probiotic bacteria everywhere if you give them to African it will create a havoc because in Africans they are not healthy they, they are not the constituent of the healthy microbiome in Africans Trepodema, Prevotella these kinds of bacteria are the new healthy microbiome Whenever you talk about Treponema and Prevotella in the Europeans, they are associated with the harmful kinds of effects. So this is also to understand, you just don't take indiscriminately the probiotics that, that, that are in the market. They may not be helpful for you. There is no Indian microbiome still done. We have not done any Indian human microbiome study. Unless we do that, or unless you know what is your healthy gut microbiome of your ethnicity, you do, do not take all those kinds of uh, indiscriminate kinds of probiotics. So this study showed that treponema considered to be harmful in the Italians are present in plenty in the Hadza hunter gatherers because they eat other kinds of food. More of the fibers and plant kind of products they eat. So this type of bacteria, they have those kinds of enzymes that can digest them. Now, bifidobacterium is not present in them because they don't eat lactating kind of products lactose kinds of pro 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 products you have to understand all these things so just like the healthy genome is not same for all healthy microbiome is also not same for all i will skip some slides our ongoing research in human microbiome in our lab is uh, focused on skin microbiome and wound mi microbiome we are doing some studies on atopic dermatitis host microbiome we are doing some study on the psoriasis host microbiome, diabetic foot ulcers. These are our very chronic kind of non-healing ulcers that actually leads to amputation of the leg. So we are trying to find out the antibiotic resistant microbiome in the diabetic foot ulcers. When very, very uh, recently, we have also joined a consortium, which is a you know, big consortium uh, from several DBT institutes which is working on preterm birth and child growth retardation. There we are, we are doing both the maternal and child microbiome. So some of our students are doing PhDs in them. In all these studies, since we are laden with the genomic uh, you know, expertise, we are doing both the host genomics and the microbiome and doing the association study now. After that, with these findings, we will do some functional validation also. Our major first study that has been done from Hello? our lab. Hello? 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 Yes, Shobhita, please do continue, please. Yeah. So if I'm overshooting time, please tell me. No, no. Just do it. I think it would be completed surely very shortly. So okay. do, do continue, please. Okay. So from our lab, the first skin microbiome study on any Indian population has been done. And we have found out that the healthy skin microbiome is not same uh, with, when we compared with the Europeans. But when we compared with the Chinese skin microbiome, compared to the Europeans, they were more similar to us. So this we did in one particular ethnicity, the Dravidian ethnicity from, from Bangalore. And we have published this study in scientific reports in 2016. This was like we have taken the sebum and hydration le levels. And the sebum and hydration levels, we have you know, got their quantitative values. We have tried to find out 
with each unit change in the sebum and the hydration values what are the uh, you know microbiome that, that change in the facial skin sorry i think somebody has forgot to mute his microphone this is very disturbing yeah please anyone if uh, except dr mukherjee if is if anyone is still on please uh, unmute you please unmute yourself yeah please unmute yourself torun sir uh, please unmute yourself now sir so okay okay sir yeah dr mukaji please yeah so we found that with with the increase or decrease in sebum and hydration levels what is the facial skin microbiome how does it change with the oily skin dry skin and normal healthy skin we have been funded by unilever international for this project and we have we are in a pro process of you know formulating some probiotic interventions in them but we will not talk about that now uh, we are also working with the unilever on this uh, dry skin we are doing some study on the host microbiome association in atopic dermatitis patients we have found out some uh, infection pathway in staphylococcus aureus that are promoting the uh, atopic dermatitis in some individuals and in india we have found some genetic signatures in the filagrin gene that were previously not found right now it is under revision they have give, give, given some revision to us and we have Uh, you know submitted back the re revision in the frontiers in microbiology journal so we think that it will get published soon so uh, we are also a part of the indian human microbiome initiative it has been taken by dbt and csir but now due to covid so we had the meeting on march 25th under the patronage of dr nk ganguly and gb nair we had a meeting in new delhi but from march 25th the lockdown started so csir and dbt are joining hands uh, and they are doing this initiative on human microbiome uh, i don't know after this covid outbreak all the funds are gone so if whenever the funds will come we will again be able to start it because the human microbiome project has been done so the indian human microbiome initiative can now be floated to do all the tribals all the aboriginals of india the the caste populations they are skin oral and, and and the stool microbiome the gut microbiome because we had more than 40000 endogamous uh, in you know ethnicities in india so uh, last few slides on host metagenomic responses to covid 19 so respiratory viruses and pandemics on earth has be, has not been new there has been several such outbreaks of the influenza virus h1n1 h2n2 h3n2 and we have been uh, ch chasing them the corona viruses are also not new they are present in the humans the benign ones they are also present in the humans they cause common cold to us the h cov type of viruses two zoonotic kind of viruses they they, they are you know actually jumped from some animals to us like the civet cats and like the camels from the bats and uh, it's very intriguing to understand why the, in bats they are all there but they are not creating any havoc in them now lots and lots of people has turned out to be viro logists now i am a genomic scientist i will not go into that there are now several self proclaimed persons who knows more and more about covid 19 i am not one of them i am just telling you wh whatever i know about it that there are two zoonotic kinds of the sars cov and, and mars cov that has come mars cov is still going on after 2012 it is still going on in some areas of the middle east and sars cov and mars cov they have a case fatality rate very high 11% and 30 to 35% they have this spike all of us know now this spike kind of pro protein and all i have found that a layman also knows about the spike protein m protein and n protein and the envelopes and the ab ab about the vaccines that are going to come so innate immune responses to viral attacks see the innate immunity genes there are like tlr3 tlr7 tlr8 and 9 these are the kind of genes that are intracellular receptors so the innate immune responses to the virus they include first sensing of the viral proteins or nucleic acids then second triggering the pathways the production of the specific cytokines or chemokines and then lastly the activation of the complement cascade if you can see in this study they are not specifically for covid they are specifically for all the types of viral attacks 
the endosomal recognition through the toll like receptor 7 or the cytosolic recognition through rig 1 or the nod or the nlrs kind of you know gene families these three types of proteins can actually uh, recognize the respiratory viruses and then the similar kinds of pathways the jack stack pathway irf7 and those kind kind of i kappa beta and those kinds of pathways are done and then the pro-inflammatory cytokines and interferons are sec secreted these are the very non-specific kind of innate immune responses that are the first line of host defense this is the reason why your innate immune system is strong even if you ha have been attacked by the covid virus they can kill it if your innate immune system is strong the novel coronavirus uh, you know has a larger rna genome more than 30 kb more than 20 to 29 genes and our human gene ace2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is expressed in large quantities in specific lung type of cells pneumocytes and other kinds of cells also in in our, our intestine also there are ace2 expression so the the gut lung axis will come to it so this ace2 can recognize the viral complex based on their receptor binding domain or the rbd the spike protein the s1 s2 there 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 is the s1 s2 in the spike protein uh, and they can bind to it after they bind a serine protease kind of thing tempers to they can cleave the s1 s2 and then a furin cleavage site is so the then they this thing can can be the endosomal entry is done so the s2 viral complex can be cleaved by tempers 2 and then you can this endosomal attachment is done based on some addis, adhesive kind of molecules and they get into your cell so uh, we have done a study i'm not the corresponding author of this study my my colleague my dear friend dr nidhan is a corresponding author of this study and it's a very interesting study that that we did it is now in bio archive we have now submitted it to some journal and it is under review uh, this study was done sitting at home during the lockdown period in march and april we were all sitting at home two months we thought we should serve the community because we were not allowed to go to our labs and do real-time pcr so because scientists were also considered to be laymen at that time and only clinicians can go out and do rt pcr so scientists have to stay back at home so during that time we thought can we do something based on our uh, you know background in human genomic re research we tried to find out why in the east asia although the coronavirus started in east the novel coronavirus started in east asia why in east asia not so many persons have died and why when it went to europe and america so many persons are dying even in india you are finding not so many persons are dying so what is there in the asians that is not present in the europeans and the americans we tried to find this out not from the covid patients but from the thousand genome phase two from the asian genome now the asian genome has also come our uh, founder of our institute professor parthob majumdar and nidhan and dr onolabho who are the co-authors the three co-authors here they had done the asian genome study along with many other scientists from different parts of asia and they have done more than 1000 whole genomes from india from different tribal populations so they had all these things with them and we have the th thousand genomes also for, for the Europe and America. What we found by doing extensive study, well, since I'm not the corresponding author, I will not go deep into it, but I'll just want to say that we have done something. We found out there is something called expression quantitative trait locus, EQTN. I think some of you may have heard about it. These are some SNPs. These are some SNPs, single nucleotide poly polymorphisms. If the reference allele is present, the expression of some genes are in in one level if the alternate allele is present the expression of that particular gene either increases or decreases significantly so it is called eqtl expression quantitative trait locus the quantitative trait is the gene expression here we found that there is we did an extensive study and we found one eqtl rs3507 it is reference allele c alternate alleles are complete deletion of C, C2 deletion C. It is present at the intergenic region between two genes. One gene is MX1 and the other gene is Tempress2. 
Tempress 2 is the serine protease and MX1, as you may know, it is actually a gene of the, that, that uh, you know, starts the neutrophil, that attracts the neutrophils in the influenza kind of, uh, when influenza attacks are done. They are, they are associated with influenza for long. We found that the, that the uh, you know, minor allele frequency of this particular SNP is higher, like 0.43 and 0.26 in Europeans and North Americans, but in East Asia, it is not even, uh, you know, it is very less. It is uh, less than uh, 0.4 and 0.2. It is not even polymorphic there. So what we thought is that this might, might be one of the mechanisms. So we tried to find out, we did some in silico study, in silico modeling, found out something in the virus ACE complex. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is that the deletion C allele, wherever it is present, it exhibits a loss of IRF2 recognition site. It is a repressor of MX1 and Tempress2. If you can see in this figure, MX1 and Tempress2 are here. Here the mutation is there. Whenever the CLE is there, IRF1 and IRF2 can bind both. So it, it is the enhancer. It is the repressor. So the secretion of this, of the G expression of these two genes are at the basal level. But whenever the C is out, then the IRF2 recognition site is is gone only the enhancer can bind and now the mx1 and temp tempress 2 expression is high so our regulation of tempress 2 will facilitate the cleavage of the s protein and the <coughs> internalization of, of the virus so if you can understand that this particular allele is present more in europe and america they will facilitate more and more entry of the virus into the host cell and the MX1 gene being also upregulated, it will enhance, it will attract the neutrophils and the cytokine storm will start. But this particular uh, gene, this particular SNP is absent in or very less in the East Asians. So even if the coronavirus is there, but the East Asians, the temperature is at the basal level. It is giving Hello? them some, yeah. Hello, no, Dr. Mukherjee, just, uh, I'm sorry in, to interrupt you. I uh, just want to say that uh, please, uh, if you, uh, it would be kind enough if you please complete it within two or three minutes as because uh, another speaker yes, is yes, waiting yes. at the time zone is another different. That's why I am asking. Yes, yes, so, yes. Uh, sorry, I, sorry I, for I, that. Sorry. Yeah, for I, that. I have only three or four slides more. Yeah. So the innate and adaptive responses in SARS-CoV-2, if you can see there, there is a study in, in this SHE et al. that has shown that the early stage and the severe stage that the, in the early stage first, the alveolar and the interstitial macrophages, the dendritic cells, airway epithelial cells, and the innate lymphocytes and neutrophils, they first start this mechanism. And slowly and slowly, it is taken over by the specialized kind of cells. So the innate cells actually modulate the adaptive immune responses. These are the potential drug targets of SARS-CoV-2. I'm not going in brief details. And gut lung metagenomic axis, there is some my, my, microbiome, bacteriobiota, virobiota, and microbiota in your gut. And that actually modulates your lung microbiome also. How? Because this gut microbiome, they secrete some uh, short chain fatty acids. They may translocate through your intestinal barrier and the, in, in, in your systemic uh, you know, circulation, and they can go to the lungs and it can create some innate immune responses in, in the lungs also. And, uh, you know, there are some gut lung metagenomic axis study where it has shown that the, these viruses in gut microbiota also damages the, the lung. And if the pro probiotic supplements are given and the gut comes back to its original shape, again, the microbiota in the lungs is restored. The immune modulation of the gut lung axis has also been confirmed by the animal model studies that the SCFA receptor deficient mice they showed increased inflammatory cytokine response in the experimental mod mod models of asthma. And the antibiotic treated mice, they failed to elicit both the innate and adaptive immune responses in the lung against influenza virus infection, which was restored following the local or distal injection of TLR ligands. So there is a study. This, this is one study that I, I'll, I'll discuss only two slides. They have done uh, this study and it has been published in a very good journal. They have done some study on COVID-19 patients, H1N1 and healthy controls. They have seen the Shannon and Chow index to be different. They have also shown by some statistical analysis, some uh, you know, genera, Streptococcus, Rothia, Velonella, Actinomyces, they are uh, you know, significantly present in the COVID-19 
patients than in the healthy controls and the bacteria there that are present in the covid 19 patients are actually the bacteria that are found in the lung infection in the patients with avian flu virus so we are all also flow floating a study with uh, some of the hospitals in kolkata and kalyani to do some host of microbiome study it is in a very preliminary stage we are getting hard to get the ethical clearances done because the collaborators are getting covid positive now and they are going back to the quarantine so it's a very hard time and uh, the new era of translational medicine is post microbiome interactions because you cannot alter your genome although now you can gene edit but you know it's not so rampant you cannot alter your genome but you can alter your gut or skin microbiome so microbiomes can be altered by modulating so you can even if you cannot modulate your genome you can actually modulate your microbiome and get uh, cured from the disease so i will thank the organizing committee members particularly dr orgo shorkar he has uh, contacted me and he has kept in touch dr people of bakshi so kind to introduce me i will also thank mr shankonath he must be in, in the audience he has helped me make the slides last minute slide preparation always the students help you so he has helped me to make my slides uh, th this is our campus nibmg we have a sprawling campus of 30 acres in kalyani we have ngs sequencers we have genome museum and th this is professor parthum majumdar our founder this is dr harsh vardhan who you know inaugurated our, our our new camp campus we have a double helical statue all throughout our building and we recently hosted the last conference that we hosted in 9 to 12th of november 2019 in kalyani is an international conference where uh, people from different parts of the world from europe actually they came and i hope all of them are now safe it is a uh, you know dr karen nelson from j craig winter institute was one of the co pis of this india embo symposium this is a glimpse of the symposium. We had hands-on sessions of analysis. Our director, Dr. Shomitra Dash, our founder, Professor Parthav Majumdar, all the, uh, you know, Paul Wilms and uh, Maria Giovanni, many of the individuals that there, several persons from, from different parts of India has come. And we hope that such conferences again come back to us. Although webinars are also good, but we hope such conferences again come back to us and we are able to in include more and more individuals from different parts of India to NIBMG. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my dear uh, and respected Dr. Shobik Mukherjee, my very own Shobik, the, for your such illuminating lecture and detailed presentation. And I think uh, the, all the participants have enjoyed it very much, and that is representing in the chat box. So uh, just two to three questions for you, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Okay. And uh, first question is from uh, Dr. Mohamita, I think. As the early phase of allergy is regulated by innate immunity, does microbiome study have a role in hypoallergic peptide development? Uh, I have not seen any such study in hypoallergic peptide development. So microbiome field is very new. As you can see in India, it is very new. Just wait, I am just to charge my computer. Just wait for one second. Yeah. Yes, so this microbiome field is very, very new. And right now we are at the juncture of identifying what the healthy and the non-healthy microbiome is. So it will be after that that we will be now, now is the time when we can find out this type of interdisciplinary kind of uh, collaborations where such kinds of uh, interactions can be seen. But I don't think that uh, in India anybody has done uh, this type of study. Okay. Well, then uh, the, another question from Saran Gupta. Can development of hard immunity be attributed to similarity in the microbiome among these individuals? Yes, actually... Uh, so who has asked this question? Uh, Sharon Gupta. So he's from which institute? Uh, as the YouTube, so it is not showing oh, his oh. institute okay. only name. So, so okay. this is a very interesting question because as I told, we are going to st start a COVID uh, host microbiome study with Kalyani and uh, Kolkata hospitals. This was one of our hypotheses to check. That is hard Im immunity if, if it is achieved. Shall we get an imprint in the microbiome? So I, I don't know. It is a very early time to say, but yes, we are hopeful that 
you know this uh, this can be found from so microbiome can be a biomarker for the for finding out if herd immunity is achieved or not okay so uh, one more last question from you are also very known dr shayok ganguly that um, he asked whether there is a possibility of exploring and modulating Hello? the nasal or respiratory tract microbiome for combating respiratory diseases in future Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Doctor Mukherjee. Sorry, I think that uh, some problem in the internet. Do you hear me? Hello. 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 Dr. Sorry. Do, come. Yeah, come again. Yeah, do, do you hear me? Hello. Do you no, hear I me? No, I cannot hear. can you can you write in the chat because i am not being able to hear some problem in the internet okay okay just just hold so please uh, go to the chat box uh, whether there is a possibility of exploring and modulating the nasal or respiratory tract microbiome for combating respiratory diseases yes, in future yes so uh, i am also writing in the chat chat, chat box that modulation yes. of you are uh, audible you are audible microbiome mukherjee you are audible it is audible. the key to uh, you know combating respiratory diseases yes uh this is the but we have to understand first but we have to understand first what is the dysbiotic microbiome okay okay so dr mukherjee uh, do you hear me now yes 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 okay thank you so the answer has already been welcome from you so uh, thank you so much and several questions are there but uh, our next speaker is also waiting for long yes, uh, so thank you so much for the detailed presentation and for your for such a time gap that you have uh, provided us for this uh, keeping in your busy schedule thank you thank you very much dr shobhik mukherjee thank, thank you, you so much Th thank you so now we will move to the our very own and latest and last speaker dr alok bera from pardew university indiana policy usa the man who is uh, very much waiting for the very much long time when we are very much sorry sir for extremely sorry for such uh, extreme time late we think uh, as because every resource person talk is too much important and every interactive session is also important to us so that's why we can't delay it and uh, sorry for that but uh, he is a man you all know that he is a man that he has joined very much early and he is waiting eagerly and he has uh, witnessed all the total events throughout so thanks to uh, dr alok bera and uh, now i would request uh, dr torun sharma sir dr sharma sir are you here sir dr torun sharma sir yes yes sir uh, so please yes sir. Uh, uh, yes sir so now it's time to introduce uh, dr alok bera by uh, our one of the senior most teachers associate professor in botany dr torun kumar sharma so please torun sir yeah i have great pleasure to introduce a scholar like dr alok alok bera not alok uh, he is used to say alok bera alok actually classmate of my wife and in the in that connection he is personally known to me since his student life he completed his master degree from kolkata university and phd from kolkata university 
then he went to um, Germany, that is uh, uh, for post postdoctoral work, uh, Sir Land and MDC University, and worked with a Nobel laureate. He has more than 25 years of business experience, and he has innovated high throughout protease assay and used for antiviral drug screening and detection. Presently, he works at Purdue University, USA. So thank you. Welcome, all of Hello, Dr. Breda. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself, please. Have all. Hello. Hello, Dr. Beda. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you are audible, sir. You are audible. Hello? Yeah, audible. Okay. Now it is audible. Can, yes, you, sir. can you see my slides? Yeah, just presenting. Uh, you just open your slides, sir. Now. Yeah, now it is being. Now you are working? Yeah, yeah, it is working. Good. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Good evening to everybody. Thank you, Tarunda, for a nice introduction. I'd like to make one correction. When I went to Germany and went to Max Delbruck Center, at that time there are 15 Nobel laureate work there. I'm not work with. No, it's unmuted me. So that oh, uh, that's why. They, I did not work with Nobel laureate, but I work with my professor. Okay, anyway, <clears throat> thank you to the, all the organization committee members. I hope everyone doing well during this corona outbreak period and the lockdown time. It is my pleasure to share my research work with all of you. And today I'm going to discuss from the scratch how when the pandemic coming, then what are we going to do? As Tarunda mentioned, I'm working at the Purdue University. Yes, I came here in 97. Let me tell some remarkable events that happened in the Purdue University. I hope now you know the name of the Purdue University. It is located two hour driving distance toward the south of Chicago. The Chicago shower is famous from India, is a Vivekananda city. In this university, I'd like to mention a couple of names. One of the names is Neil Armstrong. That's the person who stepped first time on the moon. And he graduated from Purdue University and joined to the Purdue University in 1947 and get his degree in astronautical engineering. From that time, time period, Party engineering development is very famous. And I'm, I came to this one. Oh, the house. Okay. And then I went to mention the couple of persons who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And Robert Professor Brown, 1979 in Chemistry, and Professor Negeshi, and got the Nobel Prize 
in 2010. During Corona process and everything, I like to mention one of the building is called Hockmeyer Hall of Structure Biology. In here, a lot of scientists working develop for the antiviral drugs or vaccine. What they're doing here, they're doing the crystal structure or the cryo -EM structure for that. One of the important results from the, the dengue virus cryo -EM structure published in 2002. I like to mention one of the name from this department is renowned scientist, Professor Michael Rossman. When I, I worked with Michael Rothman, I also took some class from the Michael. And, and I'm also going to talk that, uh, that my uh, the talk today is I dedicated to Professor Rothman. Let's listen a couple of uh, words from the Michael from this video. Can you hear that? No, sir. The only video is going on, but sound is not. Which is something wrong. Okay, anyway. So anyway, in 2016, Michael Rosman and Richard Kuhn first determined the structure of the Zika virus from this department. Today I'm going to talk is cleverness of viruses and biochemistry prospect. Michael and Richard Kuhn, other people also work in the virus, it's called flavivirus. And today's talk mostly belongs to the flavivirus. The flavivirus is belongs to a group of family called Flaviviridae. The Flaviviridae are the family of positive single standard virus. The virus family has also uh, makes a lot of diseases. They primarily spread through the arthropoda vector, something ticks or mosquito. The name of the Flavivirus coming from the flavors called yellow fever. From there comes the Flavivirus. There are four kinds of viruses here. Euro fever virus, dengue virus, Western virus, and Japanese virus. Flavi virus cause widespread mobility and mortality for these things. Now let's just check how the distribution of virus takes place. Here is a picture how the Western virus is distributed in USA. The Western virus was first isolated from 1937 from a woman West Nile district, Uganda. It takes almost 60 years to come to USA in the east side. With time, the spread of the virus takes place. And then by 2004, most of the half of the USA is, is uh, covered by the West Nile virus. And then you can see that the CDC results in 2007, virus is spread throughout the USA. Just look one thing. It starts 37, and then, and then it takes almost eight years to spread in the USA. But, but when you talk about the coronavirus, the corona takes only three months, starting from China to the whole world. So the spreading of virus, it depends on the types of the virus. Some case is very fast, some takes longer time. Let's see how the virus transmission between the different cycles. In general, excuse me, it's some, yeah. Okay, just there is some technical problem from my side, just wait. Thank you. 
Take it out. Now we will leave it. Leave it. Oh. Okay, so the transmission cycle of the virus and the vector. One more place. In general, the transmission of the Flavi virus took place in two kinds of cycle. One is called the salvic cycle, and another is called the lytic cycle or the host urban cycle. In, in case of jungle or this kind of system, the virus transmission passed through a lot of pre uh, animals or something non-human, and then sometimes you go to the some other animals and this, this one. This first cycle we call salvic or enzootic or jungle cycle. In this case, those things we call the amplification or reservoir host. In the last cycle, they go to the humans or animal, it's called dead end cycle. So this is the way it takes place. I'm giving some example how it takes place in Japanese encephalitis and the West Nile virus. In the Japanese viruses, that amplification and reservoir systems are animal and bird, but the West Nile virus, only the birds are there. And then finally, you go to the dead end host or the, or the animals or the humans. Now I give you another example of the dengue virus, how it's transmitted in the fish. Basically, this is a dengue mosquito at this Egypt. Actually, there is no virus particle there. It bites on a dengue infected person. Now, this mosquito is a lifetime carrier of the dengue uh, gene and then infected a lot of people. In this way, the virus transmission takes place one by one. So what happened when it is infected in the humans? Here you can some, give you some pictures. Here is a life cycle of the virus. The virus attached to the membrane in here, or the host cell, and internalize the endocytosis. And then from there, it go to the endosome. After pH change, it's fusion, then uncoating, and release the genomic RNA. When it comes to the genomic RNA, one coat is going to the polypeptide synthesis, and uh, from the polypeptide synthesis, it makes some polyprotein. And then finally, polyprotein and this replicant RNA make an assembly or budding. This budding making an unmature virus particle, then go to the Golgi. There's a cleavage of PRM protein, I will discuss later. From there, there's a pH change, and then release of the virus molecule. How this virus molecule looks like? I'll give you some example. So here is a systematic representation of flavivirus. virus. Just see, so I saw in one picture, one side is a immature virus, the other side is a mature virus. In both virus, it has three proteins, E protein, C proteins, and M protein, and here the RNA. And in the immature, there is a Plus it will a PRAM. When the PR is cleavage, it make M and then make a nice mature virus structure. How big is the virus? Sometimes question. So here is the schematic diagram of the how you see model of the virus. Generally, we can see the bacteria in the light microscope, but we cannot see the virus uh, in the light microscope. We need an electron microscope. Let's talk about the virus genome. The genome is a positive sense SSRNA and which is 11 kb length. As Shobhi mentioned, our human genome is 3 billion length. So the virus genome is very, very small compared to the human. What happened with this genome? The genome is translated to a one polyprotein, a one big polyprotein from the synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum. And this polyprotein takes had 10 genes, them C, M, and E, we call structural protein that I mentioned in here too. 
and there are the seven non-structural proteins. These proteins involve in the making assembly of the virus particle inside the cell. Let's see how the cleavage of the this polyprotein takes place. The cleavage of the polyprotein takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum. The proteins go to the membrane side, it's called ER lumen, and some of the proteins go to the cytoplasm side. In the EMA lumen side, the cleavage side by the cellular and or the host protein. There is a cleavage side you can see in the picture. But in the cytoplasmic side, all cleavage takes place by the NS3. Actually, NS3 is a protease, but it did not cleave well without 2B. So this NS3 protease is very important. And it is a 70 kilodalton cytoplasmic protein. At N terminal has a cryptin-like serine protease, and which needs to be the NS2 cofactor that cleaves the sixth position. The C terminal is has a lot of activity we call helicase activity, NTFPH activity, RTPH activity. What is the helicase activity? I'll show you some pictures, but describe a little bit more. The RNA helicase activity are the molecular motors that rearrange the RNA secondary structure. They are the motor proteins that move directionally along the nucleic acid phosphodiester backbone, separated the two annealing nucleic acid stand. So that's the RNA. So just look, one protein in the virus has four activities. Now I'm going to discuss about this, how this protein activity gets this way and talk to more details. Why NS3 protein is more important? Actually, my plan is to discover or find some antiviral drugs. The NS3 protein is a base protein because the act the protein protease activity is necessary for the virus replication. The protease assay is a state follower, and most of them it has a multiple activity so that we can target, find some drug against the NS3. So for this one, I need first a crystal structure for this protein. So what I'm going to do, instead of the full length NS3, I'm trying to make two domains of the NS3. One is called protease domain, another is helicase domain. I try to get crystallized. Here is our crystal structure, yellow fever helicase, that published in 2005 with my other student. And I'd like to mention, not details about the structure, but like you mentioned, a couple of the most important things. The past two domains, the domain one and domain two, are structurally similar. It has alpha, beta seeds. There are two alpha and six beta seated here. And in this case also, this most important is, this is called alpha beta helix structure with Rossmann fold. The NS3 domain three has more alpha helix, actually five anti-parallel alpha helix and two parallel beta seeds. So this is our helicase structure. For the, this is, for the, my protein, I will show you how the helicase activity works. So this is the cartoon of the domain one, domain two, and domain three. This is the double stranded RNA that binds to the domain three and the domain two of the proteins. My next target is find the protease structure. Actually, when we are working in this protease domain cleavage, one of the research group from the Novartis find that the structure of the NS3 protease. And here is the, some description of the protease structure. The, the blue ring is the protease domain, and the NS2B is wrapped with the NS3. So this NS2B, we know, is a 240 amino acid length that involved and necessary for the cleavage of the protease activity. So now my plan is design a high throughput fat based assay for the West Nile virus and a screen for potential antiviral drug. The most important part of this case is the design a substrate construct. So I mentioned here, this should be a high throughput screening so that I can screen thousands of uh, inhibitors. And I like a fat-based assay. 
what is fred fred is a crucial resonance energy transfer asset it is a distance dependent physical process by which energy is transformed from one molecule is called donor and the another molecule is called accept the fred is highly efficient process because it depends on the inverse of six power of the molecular distance this very sensitive experiment and technique and used for the lot of biological phenomena where there is a molecular proximity is involved let us give you some basic idea about our mechanism of the fred here is the donor molecule and here is the accept per molecule that we need when you excited the donor molecule energy transfer to the acceptor molecule when they are very close proximity but when there is a cleavage this energy will not distance the minimum requirement for the fred experiment is from coming from the excitation emission spectra from the donor and acceptor <clears throat> for donor the emission spectra and the for acceptor excitation spectra should be overlap so that energy can transfer from excitation of this one to the acceptor molecule so i am looking for a couple of acceptor and donor and finally and we use some kind of protein called cap and yp i like to mention one thing when you clip this protein like two then energy is not transfer then increase of the emission of the donor will be increasing and decrease of emission will be decreased with time so we use cap and yp and like to go how i construct the protein so i make the artificial substrate where cap pole molecule and yp molecule there and we have a some cleavage site coming from the 2b and ns3 from that side this is the sequence from the cleavage and the normal cleavage takes place after the two basic residue after r this is residue so we join together we clone in the pet vectors and cloning into bmh1 and hindi3 that's my substrate construct <clears throat> so why am i taking the capyp there is three advantage in this case so since there is a protein if the cleavage takes place i can assay with the protein gel and also i can do the proton excitation experiment so there is a double assay system and more or less since i synthesize and purify the substrate in a lab whatever change i can change the sequence and measure some more experiment so now i'm going to talk about the enzyme construct what do we know from the enzyme the ns3 as a whole is inactive protease 2b is necessary and we know the crystal structure then the 2b is wrapped hold the ns3 protein and there is the core ns2 cofactors and we, we need to put some linker between the 2b and ns3 so that protein will be associated and enough to creep inside the wrap to the protein so here is the design of the protein from the construct if we look the 2b side it has a lot of hydrophobic regions this is the important part of the ns2 b cofactor and here is the k residue and d residue so what i design my enzyme i take the ns2 b take the linker g4 sg4 and instead of kr i put hm so that maybe there will be no cleavage and in the ns3 there is three amino acids that be important the histidine aspartic acid and serine this is called triad catalytic domain residue for the serine protease and the front i put his tag so that i can purify from the nickel column let's see how is my purification of the protein so here is my protein here are my wild type proteins i run in the gel after purified i see there is some two bands actually i mentioned the protein is 70 kilo dalton but now i see it's a 70 not 77 kilo dalton it's 69 kilo dalton some kind of autolysis takes place maybe in the host. Let's see whether it works or not. I'm using my fed substrate, which is called CAPYP, and here is my gel. I purify the proteins, which lay one here, and then we add the enzymes, different concentration, one to four nanogram, and see 
what is the, what happened after incubated at 37 degree we see the well, the cleavage of this substrate between here happened with times and with the increase of the concentration of enzyme these are the products this two protein is 29 kilogalton and when they join together with the link is 58 kilogalton so the enzyme I purified is active that's the most important thing but it has some kind of proteolysis my next question is what is the proteolysis coming from it's from the host or something else so I made a mutant which called serine to alanine mutants as I mentioned serine is a important residue from the catalytic side of the protein so I purified the proteins serine mutant compared with the wild type this is the gel in my purification I see one good thing the serine mutant is not cleavage so it's very intact protein which is almost 77 kilodon but the wild type has a cleavage so now I'm thinking when the cleavage takes place I did some experiment in the both protein at 37 degree and then see what happened with time the serine in, 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 in inactive enzyme you can see there is no degradation, degradation takes place with time of incubation at 30 degree uh, 37 degree for up to 60 minutes but in the wild type we can see some degradation is autolysis or proteolysis takes place basically why what i see during our purification time that's a zero time we see some cleavage of the past there that mark the red line we call the quick cleavage and there's another cleavage takes place with time that time so there is two cleavage is a fast cleavage and slow cleavage so now question where are those two cleavage inside the protein where it happened let's see do some experiment for this i try to do mass spectrometer internal sequencing for the fragments and then confirm by the side directed mitogenesis. Here is the result from the mass spectrometer and internal sequencing. I took the, the bottom band, which marked the red, sent for mass spectrometers, which come as a 78-73 kilodalton, and, and from the molecular weight of this size is 78-70, which is also 99% match. And I sent this sequence for the internal sequencing, which can see GGVLD which is perfectly match this one. So the past, uh, I mean the quick cleavage is at the, in the, between the HM and G, we call a degenerative as in terminal cleavage site. What about the next one? For the next one, we send this peptide for both mass spectrometer and in terminal sequencing. The mass spectrometer result giving eight, uh, 18,000 almost, and from the size we got it here is also 18,000. And the N-terminal sequence of this protein is coming like GRIGRN, and which is perfectly matched this one. So we tell them internal or helicate cleavage site because this side is important for the helicate cleavage site. So we got two cleavage sites. One is N-terminal cleavage site, another is internal helicate cleavage site. Now I'm going to show the whole pictures. Here is the whole protein sequence. So we got the two cleavage sites here and there. Here is the actual diagram. What is the size of the protein? And here is the protein gel and perfectly match each one. Now I have to confirm this protein whether the cleavage site is there by side directed mutagenesis. I did some side directed mutagenesis with these two sites. So what I did, I changed the N to D as part acid in this one. For this one, I changed the G to L. This is the two mutants. I did it. So I purified it, then run a gel and see what happened. This is a side direct mutagenesis of my proteins. These are wild type proteins. This is the cleavage for the G460L with incubation 37 degree. We do not see any cleavage. Okay. So that means the internal cleavage side at the 460 position is correct. For the other side, we make 
already purified the ss learning and here the hdg mutant and we can see hdg does not have any product of this one so this is confirmed we also double check again make a double mutant where d and ldr make sure dl has should not be any cleavage here is the result in hmg we can see the band but HDGL, we do not see any product in this side. So basically, we know the cleavage side. And okay, now each question what kind of cleavage takes place? Is it intramolecular or cis cleavage or intermolecular or trans cleavage? This is my question. I have to answer and do some experiment for that one. For that one, I designed some experiment and test for intermolecular cleavage or trans cleavage, yes or no. If there's an intermolecular cleavage not, then it should be cis. That's the experiment I did. So what I did, I take the active enzyme, which is uncleavable from the double mutants, is this one. I take a substrate, this is the, that can be cleaved by trans cleavage. It is an inactive enzyme because the serine mutation, but both cleavage side, the HMG, and are in uh, is present that I mentioned before. So if these two things is cleavage, then I call trans cleavage. If not, then this cleavage in this side that happened in the wild type enzyme should be cis cleavage. I also use a positive control of this enzyme, whether this enzyme is active and cleaved by trans wave. So I use uh, my already designed the CFP YFP with a link side here. So here is the nature to test the nature of cleavage. I purify the enzymes and the substrate. This is the viral substrate with a mutation. This is called viral substrate, inactive enzyme having both sides. This is the uncleavable enzymes. Both sides are mutated in the cleavage side, but this is the active. When I purify this one, we do not see any kind of bands in here. So no proteolysis takes place. But this is a wild type enzyme. You know, there is a cleavage site presence there. That's why we can see the cleavage. Now, the actual experiment the viral substrate and the enzyme put together and incubated 12 minutes and 2 hours 37 degrees. We do not see any cleavage. So, what that means, this enzyme cannot cleave the substrate as a intermolecular. So, this is a, not a trans cleavage. Is this my enzyme is active? I did just test with artificial substrate. Arti artificial substrate does not have any band, but when the artificial substrate is um, incubated with this enzyme, we can see the degradation of the, I mean, proteolysis of the band and clip almost 100% with our two hours incubation. So the take home message is the cleavage takes place is not the trans cleavage in the N-terminal and the CETA and internal sites. So now, another question. I will do another experiment to check whether cleavage is cis or trans. So here's my experiment is, I know in the wild type enzymes, there is a cleavage that takes place during the time. The N-terminal cleavage occurs fully when I prepare the proteins, but the C-terminal or helicase structure, the side cleavage, it takes place very slowly, and we can see it is increasing with time. I'm doing this uh, information for my next checking. What I did, I take two protein concentration. Uh, basically, I take five mg per ml of the protein, it's one wild type enzyme. In this case, the wild type enzyme behaves as a substrate and also enzyme, and then I dilute it to 20 times. 0.25 mg per ml. So I have two samples, diluted and higher concentrated. So when it's higher concentrated, that means the concentration of enzyme is high. And then we do the experiment with incubation with time. So we incubation on time, two concentration, as I mentioned, the number one of each case is the lowest 24 less concentration. Number two, is the high concentration. And we can see whether the cleavage takes place with time. Yes, it's cleavage which takes place with time and increase of cleavage everything. But the most interesting part is 
If when I put higher concentration of enzyme in the number two, I do not see any significant difference for the number two. That means this is not a trans cleavage. The extent of cleavage is independent of protein concentration. The internal helicase side is also this type. Generally, if the protein cleavage by trans, it depends on the cleavage of, on the protein concentration. Now I check. I, this is a check with the Western olive virus on the uh, construct. Now I check, and because I'm working with other flaviviruses, whether other viruses we can see this kind of cleavage, yes or no. The cleavage for this one, I make the wild type and the serine mutants for the all of the virus uh, we have. Here is the results. So I purify the enzyme, that is the layer number two, and incubated for 37 degrees for two hours. This is the layer number three for each cases. And here is the purified of the S135A mutant for each one. This is uh, that one. But we can see in all cases, there is a cleavage takes place from the beginning, maybe sometimes less, and then it increased with the incubation, but there is no cleavage in the S135A. The story I told you before about the Western Nile virus is almost the same, that there is two cleavage, one is fast, one is slow, and these are the cis cleavage, but not the trans cleavage. So since the virus NS3 is a protease, and the two-third domain is a helicase, I'm going to stay show you one of the results from my helicase activity. For the helicase activity, so it needs a different kind of substrate. It needs a RNA substrate stand and another stand. There is two stand of RNA. And the higher is 30 base, and this is a 16 base, and higher ruling is uh, level with radioactive. And here the, I make the substrate here, and they incubated the enzyme with different concentration. This is NS3 helicase full length, but there is no 2B. I do not like to put 2B in here, only the NS3. Now I can see it increased the, the nature of this protein with the, it increased the concentration of NS3. So this is our, so right now we have a NS3 protein, both have helicase activity, both have protease activity, everything. Now a question, this protein has multiple activity, how it works in in vivo? So I'll give you some model. What is the model is? So in vivo, this is the model, the protein is as a polyproteins, and then initially in the early stage, it's cleaved at the six position, then to be bind to the NS3 side, and that makes the NS3 to be protease, and then protease cleave the C terminal, uh, 460 position, and that make a highly active trans protease. This protease go to clip the all other proteins and clip that one. This is necessary for virus replication. And then what happened? With time, there is a slow process of like this way, where the 2B is not bind to the NS3, and this is a different kind of helicase domain. NS3 is there. NS3 protease side is also there, but it's a different kind. And then what happened? Then they produce the RNA molecule with the NS5 replicates, and more and more when the uh, genome is produced, they make more replicates this way, and then virus go to replication and the assembly. So main conclusion so far, whatever I did this one, the cleavage of NS2, I always discuss that one. The conclusion is, Cleavage at NS2B and NS3 side in terminal is decreased by C. Internal helicase NS3 side at 460 position is also C. This cleavage is much slower than the NS2B side. After cleavage of NS3 has protease activity, but no helicase activity. The cleavage is necessary for the stop the helicase activity for the NS3. We did some in vivo experiment. experiment. And for both NS2B and helicase cleavage, it is necessary for virus replication. I will not present this data. The one of the important thing is NS2B. The NS2B is essential for protease activity, but not for the helicase activity. In virus life cycle, NS2B regulates the protease and helicase activity. When it is bind to the NS3, it will be a protease, but when it is not bind to the NS3, it is like a helicase. 
So it's kind of regulate between the, this one. So now I'm going to talk about the more detail, the screening of potential antiviral drugs. That's my first I actually need to. So how I screening the antiviral drugs? For antiviral drug screening, I do the protease assay in that depends on the plate. So in the plate, as I mentioned, this is the CFP molecule, this is the YP molecule, and then here is the cleavage site. I run some potential that I mentioned, but in the plate, we are a different way. In this picture, here is the emission spectra at 434 nanometer, which is the excitation for the CFP. And when there is no enzyme, this is the black line here is the present in this picture. What I see from the picture, the intensity maxima at the 476 for the CFP is here very low. But the intensity maxima for the 528 for the YFP is very high in here. So that means all the energy from the CFP is transferred to the YFP. Now, if I go give the more enzyme, it's clip here. When it's clip, energy is not transferred, and that gives the blue line that is mentioned here. That gives the excitation of the CFP, that gives the also emission of the 476 increases, and the there is no energy transfer to take place, that is 520 is going to decrease to this line. So basically, so we can see one liter the emission 470 nanometer on 520 nanometer in our fat based assay. So that's my plan. So here is the titration curve from this experiment with the different enzyme concentration and the relative intensity at 434 nanometer excitation. As I mentioned, the 470 nanometer, 6 nanometer emission is increased with the time and enzyme is cleavage and remove the YFP. And the 520 nanometer emission is decreased with time because after cleavage, there is no energy transfer. We can monitor these two spectra, emission spectra, or we can monitor by the emission ratio taking 472 and 520 ratio. Where just this is the plot of the titration with the enzyme concentration. It's a nice fit with this one. So basically, I can say when the ratio is 1.2 or high, what that means there is a fully cleavage takes place. When it's low, it, there is less cleavage. So that means they are intact. So now is my plan is to titration with the different inhibitors in presence of this and presence of the inhibitors and see how this emission ratio changes. So if I see emission ratio is still high, that means that means the 476 is very high. That means there's a cleavage. I do not like that one. I need to inhibit the enzyme with the inhibitor so that the ratio will be very low. For this, we did some experiment. So and also want to see whether the pair signal is linear and the cleavage that is similar. Because we can monitor the assay by the protease activity running a gel, and we can monitor the activity with the ratio of the emission at 476 and 520 nanometers. Here is the part ratio and the percentage, they are linear. So the individually, if what you see in the protein gel and what you see in the pre assay, they are almost linear. Now I can do the high throughput screening of this thing. So we did high throughput screening performed in the 384 well plates. 380 plates here, we have the assay buffer. I will discuss a little bit more thing. Here the most important thing is the assay volume. So here is the 20 microliter volume. We take 18.8 microliter enzymes and take the different from substrate that's the inhibitors and total volume will be 20 microliter. Incubated that one, we can quench the assay and then finally measure the process emission and at 434 nanometer, 30 meter, and measure the ratio of 470 and 570 nanometer that I discussed before. Here is our results. The result of the assay plate. Here we, we put some negative control in these two and the positive control with some enzyme, no inhibitors in this side. And this is the color representative 
of the, our uh, plates and from there we'll try to see which one has a more inhibition most of the time we can see more inhibition and then but we are not taking all of them as considered as a potential drugs or something and here is our result here is the primary screening results we have we took 35000 compounds in the university and from them there are 1000 compounds and natural extract we assay 120 plates and that's 30 assay and we received 309 hits that makes 50 percent innovation from that 309 whatever we got in, we test 227 products for the dose response in vivo dose response so in vivo dose response we tried the experiment with one micromolar to 25 nanomolar from that we selected 144 compounds that are active and from there we select 30 compounds which ic50 is less than 30 micromolar and six compounds with ic is less than one micromolar what is ic50 most of you know the biology the half maximal inhibitory concentration is a measure of the potency of the substrate in inhibition of any specificity of biological or inhibitory reaction so this is the primary screening result i can plot like this way so basically we start 35 compounds with after two hours assay i think we have 13 plates and we got our results that only 309 compounds are good inhibitors for that one and then from there we can figure out oh six compounds are very good from the in vitro uh, assay and that one so once you get the six compound and we can select more and more natural compounds or inhibitors and here's the next follow-up plan is called it's a lead so we do the dose response and see who in vitro the potency and the specificity and then purchase all compound and then do the more in vivo experiment and then finally we improve the inhibitors by the computational chemistry structure based design structure complex because we are structural group we can make some complex and get the crystal structure if necessary we can new compound synthesis and finally it's go to the preclinical test the leads in this way we can get some idea about the inhibitor so once you get the inhibitor do i select all the inhibitors no we will not select all the inhibitors here is our model the model for pilot selection nsc kcp antiviral drugs so what i need as i mentioned nsc that one it has a protease domain when the to be joined together with a linker or something this is the active protease and then we tested with different kinds of inhibitors that's the inhibitors and then let's see this is the inhibitor let's stop our reaction but from the crystal structure design or something we need to see where this inhibitor binds from the structure we figure out these inhibitors bind to the active site of the proteins may so that's that's why it has a low specificity but we do not select this kind of inhibitors because this is the inhibitor it can might have a side effect for the mammal because it can bind other protease important protease in the host system so we do not choose this kind of inhibitor this is the importance of the structural biology or get the crystal with the inhibitors molecule because unnecessary we do not know what the side effect so if i get a good crystal structure with the inhibitor and that do not bind that one that would be better so what i need so we can make a crystal structure with another kind of inhibitor that bind either 2B or that bind the 2B binding side of the NS3. So if you get find this kind of thing and with a structure that will be perfect antiviral drug for this previous thing. This is the way people design everything. Here I explain everything from the scratch. When you have a protein or any kind of virus or whatever, Take the protease in the end and do the very simple experiment and figure out antiviral drug discovery. The research, the talk I talked today is mainly um, is published in these two papers. And one is paper is, is, um, in 2007. It has a mostly described about the cis transcleavage everything. And here is our structure paper with about uh, the helicase domain. Uh, we have a couple of papers from our group uh, that I did not mention in this one. So in this way, Purdue University worked with the high throughput assay, antiviral drug discovery or vaccine discovery and for other diseases also. They're not only working with the previous virus, 
I can show you one of the example about our coronavirus. The recently published paper is 2020 in June 4, and here is the published data drug development, medical for the SARS coronavirus for COVID-19 therapies. And this is the Andrew Mashakar, he is the um, professor from the structural biology, and here is the uh, Professor Ghosh, let's say Arun Ghosh is our Bengali people, I know him from last 23 years. So they are publishing, uh, trying to get some antiviral um, for the coronavirus. I'm not going to discuss this in my research work, but uh, but we're still trying to get the new development, this one. This is the way we develop high throughput assay and screening for the antiviral drug. Now, time to acknowledge most of the people who are involved. So I work with the Janet Smith group. I also work with other groups. Here's the Janet Smith group in 2004. This is the Janet. And here's the Richard Kuhn group. And here's the Richard. And this is a big group. I also work with the Michael group. But um, I do not put the pictures here. I already saw the video. But here, still I am working in the structural biology building and work with the Nick Noinaj group. Here's the Nick. And here we study the crystal structure and the cryogenic structure of the most of the membrane protein that are associated with the different kinds of the disease. So again, we are still working and work hard for the antiviral, vaccine, drug, everything from the structural biology group in the Purdue University. Thank you. And if you have questions, you can ask me the question. And then if, if I don't have so much time here, I think I spent exactly 40 minutes, and here is my email ID, and here is my phone number. You can contact me. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vera, for such enlightening speech and also letting us know about the cleverness of the viruses, the biochemistry level. And also thank you for sharing your email ID to the participants. So thank you for bearing with us so much long time. I uh, I think this is no, it's a... okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much again. And I think uh, so many webinars are going on here and there, and we have also planned it. And uh, we are thinking that we are successful now. But this is a long time international conference and this come webinar. Four hours have been crossed and. Our resource persons have patiently uh, hold the tuned and uh, all the happenings have been done smoothly. And thanks to the esteemed participants for bearing with us and uh, for their kind patience. So thank you, Dr. Vera. Thank you so much again. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. So uh, now it's time to end and uh, it is time for the word of thanks. But uh, please, uh, just to start the whole of thanks. question from the uh, audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will, I will. Uh, the audience have uh, already uh, questioned and they have overwhelming responses for your year that this is so much informative presentations, detailed presentations, very much uh, adjectives are there in the chat boxes. One prominent and pertinent question from uh, Mr. Sharan Gupta. But what is the possibility of CRISPR-Cas system in such study? The capping? What is the possibility of CRISPR-Cas system in such study? No, actually there is CRISPR because we are the structural biology. We, we are doing some molecular biology, but we're not in this building, we're not in CRISPR. There's a lot of uh, possibility in other way, but since we are mostly involved in the crystal structure, on the cryogenic structure, we're not doing molecular biology at this moment. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, such response. And uh, uh, now, no, no many questions are there. Uh, if any questions, uh, somebody is asking that uh, they will question your letter as the time is uh, going beyond. So, so many questions will come from the participants. I will forward you through mail so that yes, you can uh, do response sir. so thank yes. you so much for your kind support so uh, now we will move on to the last session of the vote of thanks but before that i would uh, mention about our one student that mr shuprukash vishash of fourth same botany honors and he is doing a marvelous job uh, along with me 
and he is in supporting staff and uh, he he is support technical support behind this program and uh, he is associating uh, long four hours so thank you suprakas for all of your teachers and all the organizing committee bot bangabashi college and uh, thank you so much suprakas thank you for all and now i would request our one of uh, our senior teachers dr oli khan chen madam to unmute yourself and uh, to convey the vote of thanks so yes, oli madam please yes yes i am trying to unmute that is it now yes madam you are now unmuted uh, yes. please convey the vote of thanks thank you uh, dr argo sarkar uh, <clears throat> now it is the end of the webinar we are almost in the end of the webinar first of all i would like to thank all the resource persons who have spent their valuable time and given us valuable information we are enriched and enlightened like anything thanks to dr oshin dattarai thanks to dr sanjeev bhakto thanks to dr shobhik mukherjee thanks to dr alok bera all were very wonderful lectures we heard from them and uh, in future if we held again seminar or webinar we expect again cooperation from them then i would like to thank the participants who are part and parcel of this webinar without them this webinar would not have been successful and their cooperation with us then i would like to thank the teacher in charge of this college bangabashi college dr professor shivo prashad das for his constant support i would also like to thank the gb members dr devashish chakraborty dr arjo mitro dr partho ghosh for their constant help i would also like to thank the teacher in charge of our college who was always with us for her kind support the uh, professor pushpita mukherjee then i would like to thank the teaching and non teaching staff of our department and our college who have made this seminar our webinar a great success i would also like to thank the organizing committee then my special thanks goes to the convener who was actually the person taking the idea for this webinar dr orgo shavakar my special thanks to him and thanks to him from the entire department i would also th like to thank dr orpita sharnokar the head of our department thanks to all teaching and non teaching staff of our department for their kind cooperation to make this webinar a success finally last but not the least i would like to thank our student which orgo has already spoken uh, shuprakash vishas who was totally working hand in hand with dr orgo sarkar to make the technical uh, uh, to make technical arrangement perfect and i think this webinar is a success for all of us i would also like to thank last but not the least the coordinator of iquac committee dr gopal mondon for his kind support and being with us and i would also like to thank those whom i have not thanked finally thank you all and good night goodbye stay safe stay healthy during this pandemic time thank you thank you oli madam thank you so much for your vivid lecture and uh, thank you the esteemed participants all of you so now one announcement that the feedback link i think uh, you are also waiting eagerly for the feedback link and the feedback link will be uh, posted to your whatsapp group very shortly and uh, this after following the submission of this feedback form you will get the e certificates hope it will be provided to your provided email within coming 2 to 3 days and uh, no one will be deprived please bear with us and please uh, go on with the whatsapp group the, as because the whatsapp group is on and it will go on uh, until you get all the e certificates 
सो फीडबैक फॉर्म इज जस्ट अचीविंग टू यू सुन तो थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू ऑल एंड मैडम हैज ऑलरेडी थैंक्स टू ऑल ऑफ देम एंड आई ऑल्सो थैंक टू माई हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट डॉक्टर अर्पिता शर्णोकर एंड देवश्री गुप्ता मैडम विप सर अली खान मैडम डॉक्टर तरुण कुमार शर्मा एंड ऑल ऑल ऑफ देम एंड माई शो प्रोकर्श वेरी very on dear shoprokash and all of the esteemed participant for making this event so much successful and also thanks to our uh, teacher in church sir and uh, also pushpita shorkar uh, madam my teachers council secretary who uh, just uh, joined very much early and uh, laid laid very much very much time he spent for this session in in perspective of his Uh, non subject matter so thanks to madam also uh, thank you raka madam and thank you all so we are ending the session hope we are looking forward for another international or national any level it can be maybe any conference for faculty or scholars or it may be for students uh, we are looking forward of all of these so please be tuned with us thank you so much we are thank ending you, this thank you thank you all thank you to all Thank you so much